I got Recording like in Ryan Graham from The Intercept on the program or something. And I interviewed him and I let him speak and we were respectful, et cetera. Like, would, would anyone, would Andrew Anglin have a problem with that? I, I doubt it, you know, but it's like, it, it, it's that familiarity breeds, breeds contempt. So it's like, if, if you're a little too close or something, this person must be shunned until the end of time, effectively. I mean, I don't fucking know what I, I yeah. anyway, I, I think it's good. It's, yeah, it's it's high you know, school. It's, it's like it's beneath, it's actually beneath high school, because I don't remember huh. people being this lame in high school, actually. No. <laughs> Maybe I went sure, to the live high school, but it just, I, people were much cooler. You'll have to listen on the stream, by the way. So, in other words, I mean, I think the, yeah, the irritation know, is know. that you're like talking to his friend or something, right? <laughs> and he doesn't like you. It's like really fucking gay. I mean, I just can't believe yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you, you went to the football game with someone else and like that, you know. I mean, that's, that's just the level. Sir. But again, I think it's beneath, you know, maybe I went to a relatively sophisticated high school, mm -hmm. but I just don't remember this kind of uh, lameness. <laughs> that, no. Which was wild. Rich, you got right? the whiskey. So, yeah, he does. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's the mental illness of social media. Or it something. looks a little, well, he's been looking real. Uh, out it's, late, right now. it's something. Uh, JC Superstar is late. Yes, that uh, yeah, maybe I, it's funny. Uh, I, I remember Mark was telling me that you kind of like the musical Jesus Christ Superstar. I was actually just listening to that today. I was kind of like getting into it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was I yeah. got indoctrinated uh, by that musical through my brother. Uh huh. It, it, my brother in particular, who would play it in the car, but then my family would start playing it in the car. So I learned all the songs, and. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I liked it. I mean, I, I yeah. Step, I, I mean, I don't think I, I. There are other. I don't really have. Shocking, um, Richard. Like listen, Jesus, Jesus don't you care for your race? Shocking, we yeah. are occupied. Have you forgotten how put down we are? He can't are? sing. Yeah, Judas, Judas, and Pilate have the best songs. Yeah, and they're and the Pilate. most kind of like complex figures. As yeah, well. yeah, yeah. Pilate uh, has no, the best I, songs. I think he has this. He has this crescendo that's epic. He's like. Don't let he still me loves to sing though, Rob. your self demolition. Mm -hmm. yeah, good stuff, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I you know, but they're, they're probably better musicals, right? So that just happened to be the one that was kind of trained into my mind, <laughs> yeah. But um, I North, mean, I think that probably I'll let him back on. Oh, let's but, get him uh, back on. Let's get Spencer. Well, he might be mad that, that I'm doing this. I don't know, but I yeah. haven't talked to him. So, so uh, <laughs> Nick, are you on? Are you on the Zoom? You're just hiding behind an avatar or something? Not yet. All right. He just sent me a text message that he was connecting. Well, why would he be mad? You're not really connecting are you, now. All I right. mean, your well, side is clear. I mean, we'll give him a. Moment. Well, this is. Uh, I mean, it's supposed to be Paul. Um. So. Yeah. No. I. I think it's good. Um, well, uh, because it. Nobody paying. It, it's interesting. More it's like if it you, uh, what was Judas was singing? He was like, um, you know, we we need to separate the myth from the man. It's like when the, when I remember when this whole thing began. No talk of God. Then we called you a man. Uh, so it was. It, it's it's almost like a little bit mythicist or something. And it's, it, it like shows it, Jesus was and Jesus was a real man. Yeah, Spencer was he on here, kind of shit talking him a couple God. months ago. And then it's like it, it's you're Fantas. more important than the words that you say. And there, there, there's a lot of yeah. I don't uh, think he was even. He he's like an interesting character. And then I I like the music. That no, wasn't like, like bow, 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 nasty bow, necessarily, bow, but it was highly critical. Yeah. It's it's this kind of like seventies yeah. like into God of Vida rock or something like that. I think it's great. I actually I actually saw it live recently, um, uh -huh. but the production felt rushed somehow. It was. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, it's hard to do. the tempo. It was like, well, too fast. don't you think that Richard and basically I don't know, inspired I don't know everything that's that kind of part of the design? You know, he based it musical, all on Richard Spence. And I'm just sort of misremembering it. Yeah, I or it was that. the production, which I think I'm more and inclined Carlson. to believe that the production was uh, it could have been better essentially, right? Um, they had uh, we're waiting on when does the show, by the way, if you just joined us, um, <laughs> or you're rejoining us from earlier. Pilot, yeah. Pilot's my favorite character, and Nick, <laughs> welcome. So, Hi. what. <laughs> What is your opinion on the musical Jesus Christ Superstar? What's your favorite I number? Never oh, my God. It. Oh, okay. Well, you lived it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to see it. <laughs> yes, what the fuck kind of look <laughs> yeah. is this? Uh, yeah, welcome. 
Uh, you're looking good. Hi. Yeah, Thanks. Like it's it's right? yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm I'm really glad you're here, and uh, it's I don't think we've really <laughs> spoken for uh, you know a number of years. Tons of acrimony, and it's always good He's to just, real you know, old, man. wipe the slate Nick clean. You know, tomorrow is another day. Let me resize it. I'll move forward. And um, I wanted to talk a lot about like your life and things like that. Um, but before that, I I do I'll pay you a compliment, and he this is something like that we've been talking about a lot on this actually, uh, on, on this members only does. call, which is that. I I'm twice your age or something like that. And so I can remember the days of <laughs> conservatism in the uh, early 2000s Bush era. If you had any unkind word, if they even thought that you might think something negative of Israel, they would just like they might just crucify you. You know, I mean, you know, symbolically, I mean, it it was. I can't overestimate the degree to which the conservative movement was stifling at that point. And you could actually have different opinions on uh, some other things. You could like talk about immigration, you could talk about sent $3 tax on policy money. or whatever. And they would when they would the kind of tolerate, you know, <laughs> you know, uh different differing views. But the, the Israel thing was there. Now, um, when I when I go on Twitter, yeah, I see a lot of the old Zionist stuff and, you know, our greatest ally, the aircraft carrier in the Middle East, the Jews are the chosen people. I mean, just the visual, chosen, blah, 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 it's blah, incredible. But he looks so fucking crazy. I've noticed that it's it's maybe 50 50 if you're a conservative under no 30. He hangs around all I mean, is that that's fair kind of steal his in the sense too. of yeah. you're Jeez. very critical of Zionism. And I just want to say this and I'm not I'm not, you know, I, I'm not trying to butter you up or anything. I think this is just simply true that you have had an effect on that that they are following you oh, and even even if the fact is you know maybe it's small maybe it's large it's a real effect and i don't think that we would be seeing this without the growth of your movement and so on it's because you kind of sh- you kind of put your toe into the pool and you're like well actually you can jump into this thing like you know it's not, it's not lava. Like it's not lava like it's you know the water's fine <laughs> and uh here, here. i don't know you can just talk a little bit about but that, totally, but, but also just the, it, right? what well. your feeling is on, in terms of the the vibe of, of young conservatisms with regard to uh, the Israel issue. Well, thanks a <laughs> lot. I really, um, that's a great compliment. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, it is uh, it is pretty remarkable. And I talked about this on a Twitter space, I want to say last week. Uh, and Jonathan Greenblatt said it a couple of weeks ago. He said, it's not an ideological divide. It's a generational divide on yeah. the Israel issue that, um, you know, friend the old- of the show, Jonathan Greenblatt, like dear friend of ours. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. right. Yeah. And support. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's a big fan of yours. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, so he said that it's I think the word was crowd. sludge. He referred to you as sludge. Yeah, he called me sludge. Actually, he <laughs> said he's sludge. Yeah, not too bad. They're, yeah. uh, it's yeah. a very hateful. That's kind of a hateful remark. I don't know. But <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's uh, it is really a generational thing. And on the left, of course, it's uh, it's very different. How you much know, they don't like Israel Richard, for okay. their reasons or anti-colonial right. or for whatever. This? It's non-white. Uh, but the but you're right on the right uh, wing they're either or, going to turning uh, point meetings and well, hold on, wait, wait, we'll the talk, right trip and we're, all we're that. talking over let it talk or let their boyfriend we'll or boyfriend like adjacent or you know something like that um and and you're right i mean it's something that i mean i can't really take all the credit because i feel like i was just the person that sort of took trumpism to its logical conclusion i kind of mm-hmm. took america first which is something that trump really broke that barrier with nationalism and spoke that into existence and, and I identified very early on, and it was calculated on my part when I was in college, that America first contradicts the current situation, because it's obviously not America first. And whenever there's discussion about globalism or special interest or you know foreign influence in the country, again, there's this blatant Israeli element to that as well. And so I sort of, because I got red-pilled, I want to say, my freshman year of college, shortly before Trump won the election. And when I started my show, I said, let's exploit and force this contradiction on America first, on calling out the special interest. And so I feel like Trump kind of primed everybody. And maybe I was the guy that had to go in and kind of bring it all the way there. And I think Mm -hmm. that more so than, because I don't know that I ever had a mass, nor, nor do I now, 
had a mass audience in the way that Charlie Kirk does or a Benny Johnson or a Tucker. But I think I'm I'm disproportionately okay, known in, in the industry. I mean, I don't like to call it that, but you understand. Hit like. Like, in, I feel like influencers know me. People that are in politics really know me. Help, and I think maybe more than I influenced a, a great big audience, <laughs> I influenced a small cult following, which then eventually influenced a lot of people in the political industry. And so you get these guys who were maybe never examined the issue too closely and they're zealots, you know, there's true believers. And I think it made a lot of them uncomfortable. I think I think maybe Definitely. the biggest effect. Press is A if you think they'll the talk angle and press N if you don't think so. It made guys like Charlie Kirk self-conscious mm. about being so supportive of Israel or maybe not Charlie Kirk, Kirk, but people in that conversation. It made them aware and it either, you know, either there was sort of an internal protest or an external protest of that. Either way, they were self-conscious of if I say this, everyone will call me an Israel shell. Like Charlie Kirk got called an anti-Semite and the couple of weeks ago and he said, well, people call me an Israel shell. And it's like, that's something that I don't know if that was even in the lexicon seven years ago. So, um, yeah, I don't, think, I think, they sort of of I don't think they were even conscious of it. Yeah. I don't think they were even conscious of it because there was, there was no other way to think it was like option a or option a, you know, and, and, right. it, 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 and, and then I, I think with, <laughs> With like the alt right, some other people, and, ago, and, and also just the kind of widening of discourse with social media, et cetera, it you started to have to be self uh, self conscious of it. You had to actually justify what you're doing, and then also ask like how how does this, you know, configure with all of these claims of America first? And it doesn't, you know. I mean, Joe Biden. Um, I I've seen these images of him from the '90s where he's like. If Israel didn't exist, we would have to invent it. It is our aircraft carrier, you know, the, the, just the 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 iron fist of the American empire, whatever he's saying. Uh, but, you know, that's one way of viewing it. But I, I think you have to become conscious of it. And then you start to ask some deeper questions like, you know, yeah, there's there's notion of chosen people and, you know, holy land, et cetera, given to Moses and Joshua, et cetera, in the Bible. But also, what does that mean as a Christian? What does that mean for my own identity as a Christian? And that, that raises some complicated questions as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, and I can't take all the credit. I just feel like I was a very belligerent and confrontational and loud person, which, you know, a lot of people are critical uh, of me for those things. And, you know, I'll admit, like, I think getting attention is a strong suit. And I, I am confrontational. I am belligerent. Um, and but, but as a consequence, I feel like I forced that issue. I would show up to CPAC like you did. And I called mm -hmm. him out on the carpet like Will Chamberlain in 2017 or 2018 and said, hey, like, what you know, let's have the Israel uh, foreign aid debate on the floor of the CPAC convention. And as a consequence, over five years of persistence and just kind of throwing myself at them at a great personal cost you know it hasn't been easy uh but but i think that the issue has been forced so um yeah so it's a pretty remarkable thing but yeah but like i said uh, i think that the door was sort of opened wide by i you know i can't like i said i'm sort of i hate that expression but standing on the shoulders of giants it's mm -hmm. true you know guys like trump guys like ron oons guys like even uh, who'll be Israel on the lobby, show on thursday uh, well i mean there there was so <laughs> much i feel like this issue is kind of waiting to burst uh, with Trump. Well, it, it's definitely waiting to burst. And one thing that I've noticed is that maybe more than any other issue, I mean, you could kind of see this with like Medicare for all, where basically kind of everyone supports that, but the people, the insurance companies are like, no, never, that'd be horrible, you know? And, but, but this, this just shows like real strong divisions, you know, like you, you have all of these left at like John Fetterman, uh, who's the other, like, minivan mom i can't remember her name in congress and, and and some of these other people who kind of present themselves as like socialist or whatever they're they're waving the the israel flag and there so there's like a there's a real division i think between a changing population and some of that has to do with demographics also to be frank you know it's a, it's an unintended consequence of demographic change is that people aren't going to be you know hyper zionist christian zionist uh but then also there's a split within the left that's very strong. I mean, there's a split within the right. The split within the left is much stronger. And I think there might even, you could say, be a split within the establishment on this in the sense that, I mean, if you're an academic and if you're a tenured professor at Princeton, you're part of the establishment. I mean, there, there's no other way to describe you. And if those types of people are who have a lot of authority, deserved or, or not, uh, if those type of people are breaking away, I, I think Israel is like on thin ice 
And mm -hmm. it, I think in a Funny weird, Valentine sent three dollars. I think there was a lot of like he's a pressure for Bibi Netanyahu <laughs> to act is a this brutally I can't and violently Zoomers in Gaza. Didn't know about but I think some of that had to do with the fact came that <laughs> this isn't like 1998 anymore, and it's not 2005 anymore. And effigy, you're not going to be able old. to get away with this Stolen in 10 years. Ballot. And yeah. he's indicted himself. Thank There's that like inherent pressure. And so it's almost, I almost see a kind of now or never, like, let's go for it. Let's bomb the hell out of these people let's push him out let's let's annex gaza which is, i think is what will be the outcome of this he looks like a lame um, page with but a yeah i mean i i, I think this is like the, gaza. the la the, that's we're, ridiculous we see it as oppressive and in the sense that people North get fired yeah, for being critical of israel everyone's called an anti Nick looks like he's after his next i think hit. that's that's almost like the <laughs> waning days of this that that's what i think because in 2004 you didn't need to like police anyone you know, you didn't need to. It, everyone was, uh, yeah, it was just 740 plus if you were live on the kill stream. Or, weirdo or, or, yeah. or something, you know, or some, you know, dubious Muslim of some kind, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. At this point, you know, if you're anti Israel, it just means you're like educated. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yep. I mean, yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think that's why um, it's sort of suspicious. I've, I've been thinking about it lately. I almost think that's why Turning Point and PragerU exist uh, is specifically because when I read like um, when I read Costin Alamaru's paper on Colombia Unbecoming from 20 years ago, he was writing about how the Middle East studies departments were being taken over by progressive leftists that support Palestine. And there, there is a real panic because the university is the epicenter of where this sort of split in the left is occurring where all these progressive leftists i mean there's there's guys like joe biden who like you say 40 years ago they said that israel's the aircraft carrier but there's 500 people in his administration who are opposing the policy now and there's people in congress and on the universities which is why now they're they're pulling the uh in the uh donations from harvard and from columbia and from uh, mm -hmm. i forget the uh the other ones you pen i guess um, but this has been the battle going on on the campus for 20 or 30 years and now we're seeing the people that were graduating back then. I mean, they are now. How is this green screen worse than mine? They're now in the establishment. They're now in these places. And they're they're know. calling for Israel to be restrained. Be back sort of basis. What the fuck? And I, I was thinking about it the other day. It's like clearly groups like Turning Point and PragerU, the, the so-called campus groups, it's meant to sort of arrest like this that. trend <laughs> and to get Israel back in the good races sheet. on the campus Definitely. with the next generation. <laughs> Uh, specifically in the elite yeah. conversation. I think they don't really care maybe what the masses think who are not informed or don't care, you know, I mean, because these are people with low agency on either side, whether they're Republicans or they're, you know, the underclass on the left. I mean, these are people that are told what to think by TV, but it's the people in the universities that are on the right or on the left. They're looking for where's going to be their constituency in 15 or 20 years, because if the right is going to be Buchananite, Groip or America Firsters, and the left are following Ilhan Omar, you know, the, and, and like you said, the thing is, is that Israel has no security without the United States. If there's an erosion yeah. of support for Israel in the United States, they're done. And you're, you're exactly right. It, and what you're saying is it's desperation, that what Netanyahu is doing is desperation. The cancellations are desperation. And it's true. You know, on, on the contrary, people think that's an expression of strength. I think it's an expression of this current state of affairs, the kind of influence they wield. But it, it's also an expression of a panic that they realize mm -hmm. that the, the situation is tenuous and it won't last forever. And maybe it's sort of rapidly changing, um, which is why it's so dramatic and why it's so blatant. You know, normally or maybe like you say, it wasn't even necessary, but maybe normally it would have been more subtle. Now there's no subtlety, not over there, not over here. And that's because they recognize time's up and uh, pretty soon it's going to be a different reality for that country. They can't count on the same kind of support. Uh, domestically, and then that translates to the military support over there, which is, I mean, that's going to be a big problem for them. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think there's also something that, you know, you and I can Retweet consider. Retweet this tweet, by the way. I mean, you're, you're more of a populist, but, you know, we, we have more, you know, we have similar, Please talk you know, some, similar some viewpoints. Point. And I, I remember a number of that. years ago, Scott McConnell, who's this he he was my former boss and uh, he hated me he fired me actually this discussion um, has been but, uh, that, though, uh, but anyway three, uh three he's still around you can find him on yeah. twitter but he he wrote this article that i remember criticizing and then you know 
15 years later, I'm kind of like he was right. So he wrote this article about the ironies of paleoconservatism. And what he was saying is that, you know, you you have these paleos that are white, Christian, older, trad, generally Southerner, Midwesterner, et cetera. And they want an American first foreign policy. They they don't want any they don't want the Iraq war. They opposed it. They got burned for opposing it. Uh, et cetera. But they also don't want immigration. They, they want to keep a kind of smaller America. But the irony of immigration is that at some point, that demographic change will have an effect on elite opinion. Now, elite opinion is probably like, uh, you know, it's it's distanced from the populace and maybe it's kind of behind on some ways, you know, like the, they'll they'll do gay marriage kind of late and they'll be like, oh, look, we're, you know, we're so innovative and, you know, be, it th- the culture had already changed, you know, like 20 years beforehand, before before gay marriage, Barack Obama did gay marriage in a second term, as an example. But at some point, the, the, they're going to be there's going to be a, a radiation of the, the demographic going reality. And I think what Scott here. McConnell was saying I, correctly <laughs> is that. You know, these paleos hate the immigrants, but they Some like the immigrants for policy. The and there are going to be changes like all this wokeism. When Ben Shapiro talks about wokeism in the colleges and that's why they don't support Israel, like on some level, that's stupid. But on some level, that's actually correct. You know, and mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, they are awake now to an occupation of a brown population <laughs> by a Jewish. But like they are they have awoken to this. The, the correct then. And um, and then also just a different population. They just don't they don't have they're not going to be the Bible thumping, you know, God's chosen people, you know, Hagee style nonsense. And so I I think there is something at least to consider there. There, There's a kind of irony. Like, I don't know what America is going to look like as it becomes uh, increasingly non-white. And I think the the elite will in a way have to respond to that because they, they need to have some sort of legitimacy when they engage in in foreign policy. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, And I said that the other day, or I I should say someone else said that the other day on Twitter, that one of the actually good byproducts, and it's it's an unintentional byproduct of the mass immigration, is that they all hate Israel. (laughs) You know, a lot of them hate Israel. And um, that doesn't make me in favor of what's going on. Obviously, I think we both wish it wasn't happening. And yet, uh, there is an opportunity there. There is an opportunity to take advantage of that. And I don't think I mean, politics is about exploiting contradictions. I mean, it, it's the art of the possible. It's taking what there is and using it. And I don't. And, and the thing is, it was sort of funny. I had a moment where I, mean, I, Nick, I was you know, I literally in Chicago just and I was driving the other day Holy War and I saw Israel. a couple of uh, Muslim <laughs> kids on their way to the protest. They had their <laughs> Palestinian flags and their signs. Mm-hmm. And I thought for a moment. You know, my first reaction is I'm going to give them a thumbs up, a honk, whatever. But then I thought, you know what? But these people, like, they hate me. I mean, on some, if they knew who I was and my views and everything, I mean, I'm sure they wouldn't really like me. And I also thought that if I went downtown and I attend the protest, my reasons for supporting this are very different from their reasons. And I don't even know that they'd necessarily agree. If I go up there and say, hey, this isn't putting America first. And I mean, they're down there because they're Muslim or they're out there because it's a colonial. You know, there's some right. truth in that. Um, sure. And so that's the thing. I'm not going to honk and I'm not going to go attend their protest, but I'm also not going to get in the way of it. Why would I get it? And I saw something on Twitter as well, where somebody said, and I think a lot of whites are coming to this conclusion uh, when the non-white people that have been pouring in were taking down our realized after going to higher country, education at a good university, the Jews were silent. Then it'll the be the working silent. class whites that will uh, save white Europe. Sort of the that. middle, upper now middle will sell you down the river. Israel, well, we're expected now to I be think that's white true, nationalists. Yeah. Now we right. can be white nationals. Now we're going to kick them all out. Thank you, brother. Tommy Robinson's going to go confront them in the streets, you know, and we're going right. to be sicked on them. And I'm like, you know, no. Douglas Murray is is calling for blood. You know, I mean, yeah. it's like the one moment he 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 turns into a Nazi, like on behalf yes. of the Jews. So it's like the, the one moment Israel is being protested, like legally above board protest. He's like, they all must die. <laughs> he's just, he goes <laughs> yeah. like full, like like Darth Vader mode. This sucks. And, uh, calls uh, say, yeah, well, it's, maybe it's just, something it, will happen at some point. It, it is remarkable. Maybe but I, I mean, happen. maybe this also gets to that issue of. The this Jewish experience, because, you know, there, there's a a white national of what is it, 109 countries and let's make it 110 or what. And, yeah. and it's one of these kind of, you know, somewhat 
thoughtless I had to get memes, some meat. to be honest. Okay. But there is there's truth to that. Like they have, particularly in Europe, less so in the Middle East, remarkably, particularly in Europe, they've suffered wave after wave of expulsions and returns and revivals of anti-Semitism. They've suffered from Catholic anti-Semitism, Protestant say, anti-Semitism, you want them to talk secular England. anti-Semitism, the Enlightenment. I mean, Voltaire got in got in on the act too. I mean, it's, it is a recurring cycle. Typical Nick and fashion. so We're you kind of have that. to look at that like sociologically at some point, like, is there a cycle to it? Like, is it, is it actually ironic that they are not going to stand up for the people who actually support them? Press like there were a lot be of, better with you know, Beardson. there was me and whatever I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> yeah, it would be well, well, you know, to kind the of mix. unique, Bring but like, there are a lot of just down guys who didn't who who were probably Christian Zionists, to be honest, well. who don't want their monuments Imagine to Robert E. Lee taken. Twenty eighteen and the Jews coming in, it, it's, just shitting you know, all you could argue like, that like Spencer, probably, they didn't right? see that and they didn't see how <laughs> it would be better for them to kind of keep that southern nationalism going. But maybe that's endemic to them. You would and think I, that would I'm happen, not associating them with this so fable, the, the famous that. like frog oh, taking the scorpion across the river and it stings him. Mean, why did you do that? The well, bulldog of the movement, I was has been I neutered. I'm not, I'm not equating Jews yeah, with I insects or anything like that. But <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. What I am saying well, is you, that maybe there's a kind of... Four sent three dollars on the I only made the comment as Nick and his little crew always hate on the working class. They put themselves in this position. All the time. As you've said, they they're now getting there's a kind of pincer move the the right is probably less Im- impactful but it is turning on israel only one day when i the said right <laughs> uh your groiper movement maga whatever there, there's growing kind of criticism oh there was under, one the other chat too uh, boiling anti-semitism and so on the left that they have in a way created it's a shame with beards i mean he they, 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 they it didn't I need to exist uh, there, there's been a clear Jewish Nick looked like a guy that sold me cigarettes this morning at the OXO here in Merida, left, Mexico. The immigration, just the actual people <laughs> coming in. That they've, creepy guy they've empowered the people who are going to persecute them. I mean, isn't that kind of wild? But maybe it's like endemic to a Jewish mentality because it's happened over and over again. It's, it's not like Nick we're the going after... The, the Italians or, you know, or the Irish, or, you know, it, it, where, it, where it's kind of like, well, that, that's a that's a bit of a unique situation. This is something that like does repeat. And maybe something? there's something to that. Maybe there's an he inner, so inner, or an inner logic to it where yeah, they will empower the their own. The camera, yeah, Trump hard. does that. Watch Trump. He stole that from Trump. And they'll and they'll, yeah, but Trump they'll will shit on their like, own. I don't yeah, know. But Trump, you feel like he's saying that something. Really it's a weird way, but it's because it's to be Trump, he does Jewish. that to look more intense. And, and, and it's supposed to be more engaging. Yes. That's, yeah. Yeah, no, I certainly agree. Well, he's it's, doing that. I mean, he's getting your attention word, visually. Like that's that right. You know, because I think about right. somebody like Sheldon Adelson, who, I mean, he poured in all this money to, to sort of remake the Republican Party into the Zionist Party over the last 13 years. And and yet it's almost like they didn't protect that investment by making sure that the GOP or the GOP's base Nick looked would be OK. And, and, and maybe the, the best example of that was with Trump. Trump was no better friend to Israel than any other president and so on and so forth. And he did all these things. And then when Trump had this contested election, Netanyahu threw him right under the bus and threw his support behind Joe Biden before the uh, the election had even been resolved or certified or whatever. And that and that is sort of like an unexplainable (laughs) blunder. Because Netanyahu really lost More 34, I mean, the things we know about Trump is on Rumble. He's a pure ego Can we please again? You know he's dead. And, Kissinger is dead. The man that called him, Vietnam although, vets tools. You know, you he's dead. The that's he's dead. He did. I mean, superficially, he, he says did. he's all about loyalty. And here was an opportunity for Netanyahu to sort of pay it forward and to take care of their guy or whatever. But it's almost like they saw that in that moment, he was useful our economy, for them. And they said, well, the next guy is going to be Biden. So let's throw on with him. And uh, now we see that Trump will be the nominee. He'll be the president. And in the moment of peril for Netanyahu, Trump throws him under the bus and says, well, it was his mistake. And Hezbollah is really smart. And they're doing it. And the Jews hate the Palestinians just as much as the Palestinians hate the Jews. And it's like, you know, that was a moment where it's just a little bit of uh, beneficence or magnanimity for for an ally, for a, a goyish ally. It would have paid dividends and they couldn't do it. And, you know, you sort of have to examine the psychology there. But I agree. I mean, I think that that's why it is what? repeated throughout history. There's something is uh, inherent there in that group that they had no, keep I, sort of I, making I, the same mistake. 
if I may add, um, I think that Musk has played a huge role in the present dynamic. Uh, I know that Nick is still banned from Twitter, which is unfortunate. Hopefully you get your account back. Um, and He's I know Twitter. that Richard oh has God. criticisms of Musk, but I think that he has uh, he has totally changed the climate in a kind of single handed mm -hmm. way. And uh, and he has created more free speech <laughs> imperfectly, of course. I mean, Nick none of those be accounts are really him. NGP, mm -hmm. uh, other, 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 Kevin McDonald, yeah. uh, Ke Jared Taylor, of course, should be back on the platform. So but nevertheless, I think that there has been an increase in free speech on this critical platform of Twitter. And I think it's been very it's been kind of decisive. I mean, people people are online complaining that uh, Musk went to Israel and is kissing the ass of Netanyahu. But I don't, I see it kind of the opposite. I think that I think that uh, Netanyahu is basically kowtowing to Musk and has to kowtow to Musk. I have a relevant I think that there's, a, there's a lot of give and take with that relationship. Now, who knows where that will end or where the chips will land and so forth. But uh, he, Netanyahu, who sees Musk as, as a he's a Something, okay. he, he controls a, a key organ of media in uh, around the world, which is Twitter, of course. Right. And it's social media. So it's a democracy. It's this new democratized form of media. But I think that that has, it, it's it, Musk has been a basically a game changer. Now, we can have our criticisms uh, of Musk. Definitely in North 34, 34 be, sent three dollars. I think he's created Rumble. a climate. Nick got a lot of guy behind very, Bart on January 6th. Really put uh, Jews in that's the Israel lobby. <laughs> By the way, he's right about what he's saying about Musk. That guy, anyway, there. So that, that was my only remark. I think, he's right I, about I, that. I think that he has to kind of be some mention of Musk has to go. I mean, there's a lot of discussion. criticism there too, but. I, 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 I do like think you're right change. about that. Nick might have a little more resentment towards Musk as a, well, uh, but yeah. Yeah, no, no, not. I, I actually, I totally agree, and I think that uh, give and take well, is exactly agree, the right uh, expression because <laughs> yeah. you know, and it it's difficult happen. sort of to parse because we we see elites go and pay fealty to the Jewish establishment in various forms, and um, you know, and that's always the question: is is the tail wagging the dog, or you know, what what exactly is the order of operations there? And I think it's pretty clear, like you said, with Musk. Almost immediately, because it's only been a year since Musk acquired Twitter, which is not really a long time. And the changes didn't even begin to roll out until less than a year ago. And yet the change has been dramatic. How much the window has this shifted been noticeably. Oh, did he say like that? White identity, that Yahoo did not count out, though. Mainstream. Yeah, that is it the one caveat there. Time. It didn't it's happen. like Charlie Kirk said one or two things about it last year. And then this year, now everyone's a white nationalist. Now everyone's a white identitarian. Maybe not fully, but I mean, certainly it's it's far more acceptable in, yeah. in the conversation, even the word white than it was years ago. And I never thought it would be the case. But the same thing is true with critique of Jewish power, things like ban the ADL and talking about the genocide in Gaza or any other number of things. And um, and it, it's it's amazing that just acquiring one of the major social platforms you see why they had to shut down the technology basically in its infancy, because really you didn't get adoption, widespread adoption until 2013, 2014. It was shut down by 2017. And there was all this meme about the rabbit hole, the YouTube recommended that is radicalizing people, you know, these pieces in New York Times. And so they had to do the algorithmic curation and the censorship and the shadow banning. You open up one of the social platforms. It's so hot. It's so fast. It changes public opinion virtually overnight and, and really in our favor. Uh, but like you say, that came with, I think, this sort of negotiation with Netanyahu, where, you know, there, there has been the advertiser boycott, which has been ongoing for a year. And there are, I'm sure, other efforts underway to undermine Musk. And Musk, it seems, is sort of playing a very tactful game where, there, like you say, there seems to be a trade, like where he was... Uh, called out on the carpet for this anti-Semitic remark last week. Then he goes to Israel. He says, we're going to ban River to the Sea on Twitter. And Jonathan Greenblatt thanks him for it. So there clearly is a negotiation happening. Uh, but, but I agree. I think Musk is a very deft and strategic player with this. And I think it's ultimately for our benefit as evidenced by recent events. Yeah, look, he said absolutely correct to a somewhat random right-wing Twitter user who basically gave a Kevin McDonald argument. You know, yeah, and he just said absolutely. Cor Another this is absolutely track. correct. I mean, I yeah, that is. I I have to say that's remarkable. I just have this contrarian tendency where I like to just kind of you? hate on Musk. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <that's> <laughs> well, someone's got to do it. You know. Well, you know, uh, today he said, today he said a, a very remarkable thing. I think it was a 
or it was, it was maybe today, maybe it was yesterday, but it was an interview, I believe, with the New York Times. And uh, in the clip that people are sharing is that, you know, uh, the interviewer was asking him about, well, isn't he concerned about the advertisers uh, leaving his platform and so forth? And he was just like, fuck the advertisers. Fuck the mm -hmm. advertisers. I mean, it was, was a very nice. like, I mean, in that, I, it's just like this kind of revolutionary energy, essentially. I mean, who the who has said something similar to that? And it's not it's and it's a kind of anti-capitalistic like, fuck you. You know, you can't control my speech through your money. You're bribing it. You know, like it was very uh, I, I, I have to say that I, I admired it. I, yeah, it's hard it, not I, to. I, he called out Bob Iger. He was like, Bob, I know you're in the yeah. audi audience. Go fuck yourself. I mean, <laughs> and then he said I don't know uh, about this guy's. I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is Charles Johnson here. And you have to understand oh, there's always Charles been a Johnson. relationship. Oh, OK. There's always been a relationship between the apartheid. You know, he South said Africans Nick was gay a few months ago, by the way. Right. They're both yes. about the systematic oppression of people. And let's be real here. Like he he went over to Israel both because BB needed him. Oh, but, shit, be, you know, be, they both needed each other. It's a Why mutual parasitism. That? Like, let's not okay, let's sorry. not, you know, sorry let's not. That. The larger thing that's going on here <laughs> is the macroeconomics are shifting. Interest rates are higher. Firms are spending less money on advertising. And if you look at all the firms that basically are boycotting Musk right now, they're all Chinese implicated, right? Biden goes and meets with Xi. They cut all the advertising revenue. I mean, that that's what's really going on there. Well, look, I think that we can temper our enthusiasm and look at these things, you know, with with, with clarity. I mean, we, for example, Musk, you know, I, but I don't think anyone on this call is overexcited about Musk. And mm -hmm. no one on this call, I think, is overexcited about Trump, for example. I think that we've learned, right? We we have some experience. Jaden not even covering that. this live. We all wow. were very excited about Trump Where in 2016. And he fled the field kind of, because the raffle kind of coming back up to broken. full speed. We're, 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 now, we're now experienced as we were. But maybe that doesn't apply. Raped. I thought Jaden took a name. Don't stand on the track because the train's coming through. You're going to get showing. Nick was we, being called out by Netanyahu by name, right? Like, let's not forget, like, I mean, how old were you, Nick, when the prime minister of a foreign country came after you? Like, they're clearly threatened by what Nick represents. And this is just very obvious. And it's more like they have to bow down to the shift in the power that's taking place. That's clearly what's going on. I mean, Musk wants advertising attention, but he also wants users. And the users don't like Israel. Like it's over for them, yeah. you know, across the board. All yeah. right. Well, yeah, Charles, it seems like you're sounding a more positive note now. Um, but I, again, I think that we have to be realistic. And I think that um, your note of caution is also well taken. I mean, yeah, you know, these. Uh, well, yeah, uh, sure. because uh, again, it, 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 uh, Nick's <laughs> earlier point, yeah. this idea of oh. Trump essentially being an egoist. I think that th that also applies to Musk. Um, so they're, they're egoists and they kind of like, don't want to be told what to do when you tell them what to do. They kind of, they're kind of like, well, fuck you. You know yeah. what I mean? And the, the problem is that the problem that the Jews are encountering is the Jews are traditionally the people that tell you what to do. Right. And so when they start telling Musk and Trump what to do, uh, they get pushed back. Yeah. I don't, can uh, someone, can yeah, let's mute noise. some. Yeah, please. there's some. Please, uh, yeah, mute yourself, and we'll, we'll, we can just raise hands in just a little bit. Um, so Nick, let's go back a little bit. So I remember I couldn't find these videos because I I searched for them today, but I remember seeing a video in 2017 where it it almost reminded me of like public access television, you know, Wayne's World, but nerd version of Wayne's World, and you were a high school senior. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I, I, this is not like a gotcha thing at all. Oh, I'm, I'm just, I, 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 I definitely, it's like, I, I definitely want to know about. Oh, let's see your trajectory oh, as a very young person. Oh no, um, where Fuck. you were, if I remember correctly, Fuck. you were saying, you know, like, well, you know, well, well Trump, you know, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll stop, drop the impression. <laughs> Guys, yeah, all right. It's, <laughs> having sex with women is really gay, guys. I mean, come on, it's just you know, no. Uh, you you didn't say that, uh, but you. Uh, you said that Nick did not Trump want to laugh at that. Well, you know, it, okay, we've we've heard him; he's wild. But we need to go back to you know the big boy, uh, big boys of the party. But you know, you're 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 cautiously critical, um, mm. let's say. And then, and so that was, I guess, your senior year in high school, and you were mm -hmm. maybe 
a, a, a typical young Republican type. Uh, and and then you're look, going look, to be you. Like you're leaving be you. I, I expelled or mutual <laughs> with that must leaving whatever. <laughs> um, and then you become the most notorious, you know, person in America. So what what happened? Like how how did that happen? Because when I was that age, I was I definitely you know I'm. I'm 45. I mean, we, the internet was new. We had, we had email like at our college, mm-hmm. there would be terminal computers where you would go and there'd be like a computer and you'd email someone and see if they got back to you. I mean, it, it just, um, I, it, we didn't have live streams. There was social media wasn't even on anyone's imagination. So, but it, so I, you know, it, it just wasn't an option to become a public figure or a live streamer or, you know, celebrity influencer, et cetera. So what, what happened? You know, what, how tell, just let's kind of go back to that time in your life. Uh, well, I, you know, at that time I was a, um, I was a libertarian. I was just like a basic mm-hmm. bitch, constitutionalist libertarian, you know, and it really, it started when I was, I think 12 years old it's glory day. and I heard somebody talk oh, shit, about the private you. sector and I Stinky said, what's the private sector, you know, and I want to get in. Wow, and I said, how's the economy working? I'll so say I, that I think for... I just Googled on my iPad. Well, what's the point I'm like supposed to start there? iPad kid. This, mm-hmm. this is an iPad 2. This is not like what they have now is an iPad 2. And I, I think I went wait, on YouTube so and me. I looked up, you know, economics. And I saw a Thomas Sowell Hoover Institute video. He's on Uncommon Knowledge. That was the first thing I yeah, ever watched. Right. And I uh, just went down. That was that rabbit hole. You know, now it's, it's a very different rabbit hole. But back then it was Thomas Sowell. And I asked my mom to get me free to choose by Milton Friedman. I read that, you know, in middle school, I read, and then I read everything. I read uh, all this stuff, but I really got my brain filled up with all this conservative propaganda. I would go in in high school in the morning, I go to the library and I would go to Jewish world review, which is a website where they had all the columns. And every day I'd read the Thomas Sowell column, the Walter Williams, Charles Krauthammer, uh, the judge Napolitano, Mm -hmm. although I would read it every day. And I would read books. I read like Niall Ferguson. I read Thomas Sowell's mm-hmm. books and and everything. And, Nine thirty seven uh, live so on the kill stream. On like conservative propaganda. I got my book signed by Gary Kasparov. I got Winter is Coming, and I got it signed at the Chicago CFR thing. He was in town. And, oh, so, so anyway. the, the chess champion and and kind of Putin critic. You met him, or yeah, at least he, briefly. He had a, he had That's a book talk uh, interesting. over here. And um, so, so I was like a neocon, neo lib, whatever, really you know, know like yeah, defending right. the Iraq war and like we can't let Iran get the bomb and all this. Right. And um, so initially in Remember, the 16 we election, I was I was a Rand Paul guy. Yeah, we course. did. Rand mm-hmm. Paul. And then he dropped out. I was a Ted Cruz guy. But, you know, I sort of had a series of realizations my senior year so of this high school and my freshman year of college where on Milo. first I realized that. Uh, there's a role that the media plays in politics, they you know, because when I feel like when you're in high school, you're sort of vaguely conservative. And when you're at that age, you see like these fag kids that support Biden. Uh, I forget their names. You know, I'm talking about those two young kids, mm-hmm. the Zoomers. Um, oh, God. And, yeah, they're totally, you know, appalling. and like these the TikTok Republicans. And when yeah. they get in debates, they're like, no, Republican presidents are better than Democrat presidents because, you know, you know, Trump passed or whatever thing. And so you're very ideological. And then I sort of had this realization about structure, you know, structurally how power works. And I said, well, the media is so influential. They make it so that like, even though I'm a libertarian, like real conservatives can't win elections because of the role of the media. I said, so Mm -hmm. there has to be some level of handling the media to have power and do what you want with power. So I said, Trump is who the media hates because Trump fights the media. He's discrediting the media. That's the, you know, the road to libertarian republic runs through defeating the media. So it's Trump. And then I had this realization about demographics. I saw that map that I'm sure we've all seen that said, if only white people vote, if only black people vote, if only. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, the immigration trends are such that we're losing Texas in 15 years. Why is nobody talking about this? So initially it was like this tactical thing where I said, you know, I, I don't love that Trump is a statist, but he can beat the media. He'll close the border. He'll secure the Republican Party. And then, you know, I read Edmund Burke in college. I read Pat Buchanan. And what stood out is in Death of the West. He talks about, I think, in the Denmark Jubilee. He said, what happens when the Muslim protesters on the other side of the river outnumber the police or outnumber the native people? Different civilization. Um, 
And so it's just sort of this cascading sort of series of things where I, I was reading deeper and I was, you know, we had sort of like a round table when I was in college. I met the only Trump supporters at Boston University. And it was like four of us. I was a neocon. One of them was your biggest fan. One of them was a huge fan of Jordan Peterson. One was like a Steve Pinker guy. And we right. go and it was like the alt-right, you know, rabbit hole round table. And, um, and anyway, so that, that was a sort of transformative process that turned me into, for lack of a better word, like a white identitarian, white nationalist, mm -hmm. aware that the Holocaust is maybe exaggerated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, what made me a pariah is I, I just started to become vocal about these things. I got linked mm -hmm. up with RSBN and 40 uh, away from one K share the link with daily wire. And I was very <laughs> insistent on questioning, you know, Hey, we're all Trump people. We're all America first. Why are we giving $4 billion a year to Israel? And you can understand, I'm sure what happened next and the rest is history, you know, but that's why I give so much credit to Trump because Trump really, for me, he red pilled me Trump and Sam Hyde kind of red pilled me, changed my consciousness and made me aware of these things that as a, as a teenager in the suburbs of Chicago, I mean, you can never be aware. I didn't know any Jews. Yeah. I didn't know really even any black Chicago? people for that matter. <laughs> but, you know, you go on the internet and, and you become aware of the, how the whole country is there's trained, plenty of Jews changing in Chicago the that those groups are playing. Yeah, yeah there's plenty you know, of Jews in Chicago. We, we're obviously <laughs> highly critical of Trump and, and also kind of analytical. I, I also see him as like Trump. a phenomenon at this mm -hmm. point. And, and, and it's one that I'm, I'm distanced from in many ways, but I, I do think that you're, you were right to say that you got red pilled by Trump. Like it, it was, despite all the bombacity and stupidity and, you know, grab him by the pussy, all the, all that stuff, there was something unique. He incarnated some power or, 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 or force or emotion unlike anyone else. And I think he continues to do that. And I think actually that's why he's going to win because he, despite it all, desp I mean, the, I don't even need to go into the level of stupidity. Of, of I bet Donald you Milo Trump, was like, you know, speeches and, and a lot of the movement and things like this. Can't be brought up but on the show. It's just even despite it all, he's money. power. I mean, what, what I was yeah, thinking I think so as well, um, and I, I was talking about oh, this a, a little bit the last time, it's, it's like, yeah, the deep uh, state I mean, or liberals, they're all too, very concerned. They're very like concerned they're about, about, about loss anything of anybody's you know, interested what, Whatever that means, exactly. The school. loss of decor. Run on right? tomorrow and, and, night and on so the kill street. And so they're going to use what they think are, are powerful and definitive means. Like they're going to use the legal system to attack Trump. And so we're going to get him on, oh my God, you know, money to a porn star, you know, you, you you look like some crazy old man with a bunch of documents in your bathroom. I mean, you know, they're going to get him on these things. He's actually speaking the truth. And most Chicago Jews live on the North Shore okay. where all the, the John Hughes movies it, it were just filmed. Doesn't matter. All Trump's, right. Fair enough. DeSantis started Fair enough. collapsing in the polls the moment Donald Trump got indicted, which meant that all of those people who were kind of like, well, let's 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 look around, you know, maybe maybe we can find someone else. They just they 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 went back to Trump. They circled the wagons. Now he's running away with it because it's like the power of the legal system and bureaucracy and mechanisms and advertising and corporations, all, all of these like instruments, but they're 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 neutral. They're they're just like the legal system is just this kind of like you know what I mean? It, it, it's it's a uh, a technical way of attacking someone. Trump is not technical. Trump incarnates some energy. Maybe it's horrible at some level. Maybe it's it, maybe it's wonderful in some way, or, or at least understandable. Maybe it's anger and resentment. Maybe it's actually hope on some other level as well. Whatever it is, it's like the force of belief versus the force of a technical deep state, a a robot effectively, and. The belief wins, you know. He like he's going to just because oh, yeah, they're, they're they're both bags. they're not confronting <laughs> him mano a mano. They're not going to defeat him politically, and they're not going to offer a competing vision. Like this is our vision of the world: socialism or or whatever. They don't offer anything. They're simply concerned about democracy, and he's 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 just despite all of his failings, he's just this power of belief and emotion that is just going to steamroll them. That's at least how I see it. I did not even think I would be saying this not too long ago, but I think he's going to win. And uh, 
I think it's going to bring upon a political crisis, actually. But but I'll just start with that. I think he's going to win because well, he has. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I would say that the other factor here, too, as well, is that the, the Democrats have obviously completely lost their nuts. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Right. And I think that they when Hillary Clinton lost to Trump, I think it was just a kind of uh, they were crestfallen and they haven't recovered since. Uh, mm -hmm. And they've lost all confidence. Uh, they're no longer a kind of innovative or bold party. They're running guys like Joe Biden. I mean, come on, dude. You know what I mean? They, they've just lost their balls effectively. And they so the wind is kind of out of their sails and they, they're demoralized and they've lost confidence. So I think that that's the other aspect of what's going on here. Anyways, mm -hmm. uh, Nick, please. Yeah, no, I um, I, I totally agree. And um, I mean, I like Trump. I know you're very critical. I love Trump. I love mm -hmm. him as a guy. He's like, you know, and, and that's because he's sort of like the man, the this larger than life. I mean, he really is like the dominant force on Earth, like for the last seven years yeah. in some way. I don't which is fucking disagree incredible. with that. As crazy as that is to say, I don't disagree with that. Yeah. And yeah. the thing is, he, he really and I think people I think that they sell him short because you really have to be a remarkable human being, uh, the kind of stoicism that he has. And I, I know that people think that he's sort of chaotic or um, disorganized or something. And I think that's actually true. I think that his, in terms of his team, there's obviously flaws, you know, that, that people understand. Um, but as a man, there's a still, you know, because you would look at almost any other figure with that level of notoriety or that level of pressure or power, or whatever. And almost all the time, it's, there's some deep personal problems going on. It's drugs, it's a scandal, it's mm -hmm. this or that. He seems like he's like this superhuman. It's like people forget that he's a man because he has embodied it. Um, you know what you're talking about, this energy. And um, and as far I mean, I think you're totally right about him going against the system. I also think it's the extent to which the authority in the country has lost all legitimacy. I, I mean, that's the biggest pants, crisis I think that Trump. he presents is because, you know, the, the state the, rests what, on. The I mean, that probably was pretty right, cool, to be honest. <laughs> and legitimacy is based on, you know, these things like democracy and everything. I mean, and yeah. I think what, what Trump is yeah, 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 undefeatable yeah. is because he pretty is pretty the right like crux of the argument that lays bare the hypocrisies, which we're all sort of vaguely aware of, maybe in the background that everything's corrupt and that everyone's mm -hmm. a hypocrite and the liberals are full, full of shit and all this stuff. And he kind of th gets in the middle of that and shows that the system is, it's a, it's a system pretending to be an institutional, like in some either. ways, like it's pretending to be a mechanistic system. Like you described, we're a nation mm -hmm. of laws, not men. Well, that's not really the case when Peter Strzok and Lisa Page and all that stuff's going on. We're a nation of laws, not men. Really? That's why he's being sent up for 700 years. Meanwhile, like the Hunter Biden thing goes on and, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't need to go into all the a lot of it's Fox News. And yet there is a truth in there, which is that there are these deep hypocrisies and contradictions and double standards where, you know, going up and beating your chest about the rule of law and democracy. It doesn't really work. People say, you know, sacred temple of democracy. Fuck you. Really? I mean, after everything that's gone on in the past 10 years or mm -hmm. 20 years, 30 years. Um, so for that reason, I think, I think that's a big part of why he's a threat and why they're coming after him. And, you know, Biden's the best representative of what you're describing because he's not, there's no personality there. He's not a person. Everyone recognizes yeah. he's, he's a, the face of a person. He's the face of a president, but there's things working behind him to carry on the day to day. And I think that's what people don't like. They, they want a king. I think that's why almost people identify him with Caesarism because they recognize that Biden is the prototype of what every leader is in every country and everyone in Congress, which is they're a personal face on an incomprehensible, complex you opaque saying, system you that has no accountability, that people can't even understand. We want people feel like they have no control over their life or society and they don't like how things are going. And here Trump comes in. And my favorite line from the announcement, he said, we need someone that will literally take this country and make it great again. Those were his words. We need someone to literally take the country and make it great again. Mm -hmm. And there's something so magnetic about that idea. Like, like you said, maybe it represents grievance, maybe it represents hope that, that it is within our power, it's within our grasp, that things can't Talk about change, rather than that we have to resign ourselves to 
a horrible future, which I think Talk there is a the tremendous amount of dread, which Connie really has nothing to do with Trump or Biden, but Give me something. it's a dreadful gray, I mean, literally a gray society. And Trump mm-hmm. represents the the maybe the number one boomer, the number one boomer that can change your oil from an older time, you know, this impervious man, mm-hmm. the Bruce Willis, the Clint Eastwood, who's going to go in, kick some fucking ass, take the country, make it great again. Yeah, but that's not real. Even if we both know that's not what happened at yeah. all. Like, it didn't come close to that. Uh, and he's, you know, <laughs> right. you know, lacks confidence in governing and maybe doesn't even want to. That's what he represents. Okay, what was he like as a person? Like when you've, I have never met him, so I've been somewhat close to him, I guess, but I've never, like, what, what did when you were sitting at a dinner table, like, what did you talk about? Like, what, what did, what did he talk about? Like, I don't know, sports or <laughs> women or what was he like? UFC. Well, he's um, Colby Covington. He's very UFC. Yeah. Well, he, he does love the fighting. If you've seen him, he's too busy, furiously. He's incredibly charismatic. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll just say that you know he's very he's quick he's likable he asks questions he pay, very much like what you see on TV you know he's a he's a quintessential businessman in the sense that I mean you've met entrepreneurial types and you know you know the vibe they give off and so he mm-hmm. kind of had that going um, but th- there was a turn so we talked about a lot of things like for, what was really funny is first he tried to I'll, I noticed this he called Kanye by his name Gay. Uh Which was interesting because I feel like, you know, anyone that's 75 years old doesn't know that Kanye changed his name to gay. You know, I mean, they don't even, they would see him and be like, hey, are you that rapper? Yeah, right. I was calling him, I was calling him Ye for like a month. Yes. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I'm glad he didn't call him the N-word. I mean, that, yeah. That would Go be worse, on. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, we were with him. Pe- people who are fans of, of him would come up to him and say, yo, Kanye, can I get a picture? Yeah. And he'd say, well, I will if you call me gay. You know, but even his fans hadn't caught on, but Trump knew. And that's like one of those, like, how to win friends and influence people shit, mm-hmm. like, you know, that he knew that. And the first thing, the first way he tried to engage Ye was he said, and there's pictures that have been taken since. I talked about it a year ago. He has this iPad that controls the music on the patio of Mar-a-Lago. He's obsessed with it. He loves DJing for the part. It's a party every night at the Mar-a-Lago patio, which is like a restaurant because it's a club, you know, mm-hmm. and he DJs, he picks the playlist when, you know, and uh, everyone's, it's like the King's court. And he's in the sent middle $2 on Rumble. Broke, God, all these guys are F and the music. I agree. So <laughs> the first way he engages, yeah, is he says, Hey, I have this iPad. It's unbelievable. It controls the music. You can pick any song. You, it has every song. <laughs> so he has, yay, yeah, pick a song to, to play for the dinner. And he starts talking to him. And I, I was almost mortified at the at the start because he engages him with like the black voter pitch. He's telling about opportunity zones and the, uh, mm-hmm. the what was it? The first step act. And, and I'm Platinum like, dude, this is a song. Yeah. Now at that yeah, time, that's what I want to like, know too. When I showed up yeah, I on know the first the day with. at the office in LA with Kanye, he was drawing swastikas in a notebook. Okay. Literally he's trying to, and he's, he's fully red pilled. And so we pull up and Trump's giving them the, the black voter pitch. I'm like, Mr. President, like we're way past but with all due respect. <laughs> this, this is not your ordinary black Republican. Yeah, okay? yeah, right. You're not talking to Larry Elder. We're way past that. Okay. Yeah. We're, well, supposedly we're he wanted, that. Like, and anyway, be his so that's how it started. Right? And, you know, Ye brought this other black guy who's, you know, some affirmative action, like engine engineer. And, you know, so Trump strikes up a conversation with this guy and he's an idiot. And me and him start talking. We're talking about too social. And he asked me about the DeSantis thing because I sort of insinuated, you know, I liked his attack. on Plus, DeSantis, he played some 808 deep cut. Trump told him to play um, a hit. But there was really? this turn anyway to arrive. Right back, <laughs> there was this turn in the dinner. <laughs> That sounds Trump exactly like hostile. Trump. Because I think he became aware. <laughs> it's a long story. But he basically that. became aware that, you know, maybe something wasn't necessarily right. Now, I want to say for the record that it was not, you know, everyone said it was set up. Everyone said that, you know, we tried to trap him. That's not true. Uh, but Trump had reason to believe that it was like that. It's a long story mm-hmm. why that was. But he, he he got a call in the middle of the dinner because of a clerical mistake. And it was a that heads up, true. like, hey, maybe they're trying to mess with you. And so Trump became hostile. And when I say he flipped on a dime, it was unbelievable. He started telling the story about uh, 
one that rapper that got locked up in I think it was Sweden mistake. and then Trump secured his release. Oh, yeah. I, I forget the that, whole story. Yeah. Was I, I think it Rogers. was uh, little little Nas or something. Yeah, mm. something. Like no, that. it was. Um, oh, okay. Well. Kodak Black, I think. Or no, it was ASAP like Rocky. Anyway, I don't even know some ASAP Rocky. Someone just said yes. ASAP Rocky. That's right, ASAP Rocky. And so <clears throat> Trump launched it. And now the whole dinner, he had his presidential face on, and he was just being the president. He was very nice. He starts telling the story and starts dropping a hundred f bombs, like which is weird because. This is the president. You know, there's some decorum. So he starts telling the story and goes, so I told them, listen, you fucking motherfucker. We're going to just like crazy. Everyone's like, whoa, (laughs) like what just changed? Well, anyway, he tells a few stories like this. And the moral of all of these stories about that one and LeVar Ball and um, Kim Kardashian, the moral of all these stories, he told three stories about black people that were not grateful to him. Black people, he did something for them and they weren't grateful. And there is a very not so clear subtext. Yeah. And, you know, and at that point, Ye asked him if he would be the running mate. Because, you know, when we were driving up there, Ye was like, this is going to be great. I'm going to ask Trump to be my running mate. And everyone said, oh, that's funny. And he's like, no, but it's not a joke, though. I mean it. I want him to be my running mate. So uh, it was. he kind of forgot that he wanted to ask that. And Karen Giorno was at the dinner. She was kind of kick him on, kicking him under the table and saying, like, hey, remember remember what you came here to mm-hmm. ask and remember to say your line. So Ye said, hey, would you be my vice president? And Trump flipped. He, he folded his arms, which you've seen him do sometimes. He kind of leaned over the table and he's like, listen, you know, you're a winner. You can win at a lot of things, but you'll never win at this. You, you know, maybe you're, you're good <laughs> at the music and this and that, and you could do other things, but you'll well, never, it is you'll never insulting, win at really, this. Huh? You can't. And then he well, turns yeah, to is. me and he goes, tell him he can't win. I know you're a smart guy. Tell him he can't win. I mm. know you work for him. Tell him he can't win. He lost well, he can't win. His, <laughs> his mind. And, you know, it's weird saying it, but it felt like he was going to get up and start punching us in the face. Like, so he just exudes this like, like a mobster. I would compare it to like Tony Soprano. It felt like Tony Soprano wow. getting up and getting in our face and intimidating, like real, like mobster shit. So that Please, was sort he of should like, have punched first, Fuentes right and like I said, there face. was a split where one minute he was like the car salesman, nicest guy you've ever met. You know, he, he knows hit Paul like yay. And he's a very nice guy. And follow the channel. If you don't Flips already on a diamond says, fuck this and fuck that. And he says, tell your wife, tell your ex-wife. She's a disgusting human being. He told, <laughs> he told yay. Next time you see her tell you, she's a disgusting human being. Cause I released her friend and she voted for Biden and, and going Tony Soprano. So, I mean, he really is like, he's a right. Force. He's a force of nature. He's not even a human. He's like a force. It's kind of scary of, uh, to be around him when he's in that mode. He kind of gets, he get yeah. he, he gets into that like warrior mode where he's going to yes, kill someone. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Beast mode straight up. It was awesome. And I, and I was just <laughs> like, this is awesome. You know, this is awesome. So did you so, tell, did you do what Trump said? Did you actually tell Ye that he can't win? No, I totally, I mean, look, because you got to imagine, I mean, these are both of my, I love both of these people. These are both right. of my personal heroes, right? They both like me. I just got to know them. So I just didn't even say anything. I was just like, please don't make me say, I was like, well, I don't know, <laughs> you know? Because yeah. I'm like, who do I, I couldn't say anything to Ye because Ye brought me there. Yeah, sure. It'd be very disloyal for me to be there. And, you know, so I, I'm trying to be Ye's wingman, but also it's like, this is like my father's, like Darth Vader saying, mm-hmm. you know, hey, do this. But so I just kind of I was like, yeah, well, I, don't, I don't know, you know, um, did, did you think that the Trump movement was kind of over like that announcement speech, which I guess took place around a year ago or so, um, was just terrible. Um, I, I actually remember people pointing out Spencer and Fuentes had the same opinion. It was just like no energy. He's just a typical Republican now. What's the point? I mean, did you did you think that Trump was over and that's and you thought that if if there were going to were to be a, a vessel for this dark energy, it might be Kanye West? Well, <clears throat> you know, it's um, here's the thing. I, I sort of knew from the outset, like a lot of people did, that um, EA had dark ran energy. before, you know, he ran yeah. before and they didn't even get on the ballot in most states. Yeah. And um, 
So I recognized that it was sort of a long shot, you know, that he would win the nomination to become. But I did think it was possible. And we were we were seriously putting together a serious campaign that would win. And I I honestly I believe that he could win in the future. I think that if he mm-hmm. ran in 28 or some other time, because Ye has the same intuition that Trump does. And I know that, you know, a lot of people sort of roll their eyes at that. They say, oh, really, you think this rapper's a genius? I do. I think that, you know, any serious person has to look at his legacy, which is that he has been at the top of the music industry for 20 years. Who else does that? Who else puts out an album, 10, 11 albums, and they go number one. And he's, he's the biggest streaming artist, top five, and he didn't put out an album last year. Not only that, going to any mall. And you will see shoes influenced by the Yeezy. What what other musician does both? Or one of mm-hmm. them. Very, very few and far between that has that kind of cultural influence and staying power and dominance. So there is, he is a genius. I really believe that. And I know that because. We're the only ones who have this things about too, politics, apparently. even without knowing apparently. much about politics. I that why. Most people I would never understand that. in a lifetime. Most most political junkies, what do you- if it slapped them across their stupid fat fucking face, they wouldn't get it, you know, because he just has some wisdom. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, the, the big idea, I thought, is that maybe that would snap Trump out of it. I thought that what Trump needed at that time was an opponent, because what had happened is that Trump. That's what, you know, what had happened shout out was, to the Gamer Uprising Forum. I, I saw we got a link there. Present. And I think that he was low energy and the speech sucked. He needed a foil. He needed Gamers a dialectic. Rise up! The, in 16, yeah. the dialectic was him versus everyone else. And yeah. that made him what he was. What he, he sort of became this Flanders, oh, Flanderized the character. There's so and few of them these days. He had been captured and assimilated <laughs> into the RNC. Like an and and yeah, I thought it was basically I didn't doomed. Ban I thought even Ahmad if he wins, him. it's not going to be worth it. I, I was looking forward to DeSantis I know, announcing. I know, I see that. And I actually I, commended I him for attacking DeSantis. At the dinner, I said, look, I said, when you called him to sanctimonious, not only were you in the right, but also I said, this is what got you elected. People aren't here for McDaniel and McCarthy and, and all that. I said, they're yeah, here for yeah. you. And, you know, I said, the moment that was awesome is when you raised your hand at the first debate and said you'd run as an independent. I said, because that's the kind of deal making that we need at the table, not not the sort of we'll get them next time, live to fight another oh, yeah. day bullshit Republicans do and lose every year. And anyway, so when I sort of jumped on the yay bandwagon and he and, he, and yay agreed too. me and yay both love Trump. Ye loves Trump. He's his hero. And he thinks he's an incredible politician. And Ye said that, you know, either Trump would be his running mate or he'd be Trump's running mate. And even if he didn't win, he would endorse Trump. And I sort of had the same idea that if, you know, ideally, honestly, Ye would win and then we would have this president that loves Hitler. On the contrary, you know, worst case scenario, he drops out and endorses Trump after he brings the the beast back out of Trump. And so, right. Uh, But people didn't understand that. They said, well, you're disloyal to Trump or whatever. And it's like, no, that just like with Andrew Yang, this is something that is that is going to throw a wrench into this totally stagnant sort of system and and maybe produce a better outcome. That's that's I I actually understood it. It, It's it's funny because I I was so used to being against everything that the right did out of my, you know, contrarian Mm -hmm. instinct or I, I was just fed up with MAGA and all that kind of stuff. But I kind of, I, you know, and I didn't, I, I didn't join it exactly, but I definitely showed a lot of respect because I was like, he's, he, you know, he's going on stage in a mask and he's, he's doing all this crazy shit, but that's like great because that's mm-hmm. what you need. You need to be fucking crazy. You need to like call up that the dark energy. You need to go there in order to be relevant because uh, otherwise you're totally, it's, it's not. It, it's it's not like you, you want to calculate and do a little of this or that. No, you need to go full dark side in order to win because otherwise you're going to lose. And so I did see that with Ye. I surprised myself. I'm not a fan of his music. You're you're long. You know that I we have different differing music tastes to say the least. But <laughs> yeah. but 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 I I just saw it and and it, it was it was just. It was calling up something really authentic and real, and I just I just loved it because that's that's <laughs> what we need. We don't this America, America is going down the fucking tubes. America sucks. I mean, our culture is horrible. Everyone's unhappy. Everything's way too expensive. Like we're looking for a savior. Everyone wants that. And again, the left d- just refuses to present it. You know, like I'll 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 defend Biden t- to some degree. I, I I think he's a decent guy. Yeah, his presidency up until 
the Israel stuff I thought was was decent, actually. I'm glad we got out of Afghanistan, you know, child tax credit, whatever the fuck, you know, it's good. Um, but again, he's he doesn't represent anything, as you're as you were saying. He's just this old guy kind of sort of managing a system that's beyond his control. And I, I think we're we're in it, we're in an age of anxiety in where you know in, in the 2020s and and I think beyond. I think we're in an age where we're in a kind of post-religious, post-Christian age, but not in the sense that everyone's becoming atheist. I, I think in the sense that everyone is looking for a savior. I just think that's very true. And if you can't offer that, if all you offer is we are going to not appoint a conservative Supreme Court justice or we're going to protect democracy, whatever the fuck that means at this point in time, it, you're just going to get bulldozed by something where it's the power of belief. I mean, I do think that Trump will probably disappoint you, but he car- he carries that messianic energy with him. And that <laughs> that is something that's very real. That's something that people need in this day and age. And so I I have a undying respect you out over for there, people Rob? who are willing to carry that energy forward. You know, on a less yeah. uh, on a less profound note, uh, some <laughs> people say that comedy is dead, and I think that there's great evidence for that. Point. SNL hasn't been funny Looks for like twenty we have a years. Caller. Oh yeah, but that appearance with caller, you no. and. Uh, Yay uh-huh. on Alex Jones was the funniest fucking thing I've seen. Oh uh, my god! Yeah, it was just hilarious, man. Um, so I enjoyed that. I appreciate it. So if nothing else, that was just a, a, an epic moment of comedy uh, that I don't think that can be replicated or repeated. Yeah, uh, I like when it, Alex it was Jones so was like strange and like perfect. we know that Hitler is truly a a, a, a puppet <laughs> of of the uh, lizard people, but uh, we don't like Hitler. And then yeah. Kanye just called him on it. He was like, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I like Hitler. <laughs> well, the best part, he goes, no. uh, he goes, so you like the uniforms? No, no. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> There's right. a lot of things. <laughs> which is so, like, that's such a perfect sense. No, there's a lot of things I like about Hitler. Which is yeah. So, yeah, and they sort of out Alex Jones, Alex Jones. Um, well, yeah, and I agree with you. And this is one of the reasons why well, I didn't know it'd be all I mean, about you come from very different places. You're, I mean, some of it's interesting, you're but like, Nietzschean and you're, I know, not a Christian by any stretch like, and, all, and all that. Huh? But I think one of the reasons why maybe there's a mutual respect is because I think we both have a contempt for yeah. the ordinary and for the, yeah. especially for like the stodgy conservative. Because I feel like that's one of the worst things that happened to Trumpism is that when Trump came out in 16, he was a billionaire celebrity with a gold tower and from New York. And now it's become just as campy and cringe and lame as, as the old Republican Party. You get these people mm-hmm. that go there and they're like, you know, I like Trump. You know, I'm, I'm on the Trump train. It's like, you know, so this is we're just doing that all over again. We're just doing Reagan again and, and all that crap. And so a big part of why I like, yay, yeah, is like you say, he's well, he's cool. He's cool. He's different. He's forward thinking. You know, people may not get it. People may not like it, but it's different. It's it's forward. It's radical. He's not. I mean, he's a true rock star. Like he's not a pussy at all. He'll go on there and, you know, every other conservative will say, oh, oh, let's check in on the magic Americans, you know, and then, you know, yay, who's a billionaire celebrity with everything to lose will come out and say, Def country on the Jews. I love Hitler for many reasons you know, and mm-hmm. all that. And uh, and I'm with you. I look at those figures and and I and I'm with you on the power of true belief. There's nothing more powerful than true belief. And, you know, people that can harness that. I want to be a lieutenant. I want it to rub off on me. I want to be a part of that. Other people don't. You know, they're like, um, how exactly is that going to win? You know, how are people and they want to vote for DeSantis exactly. because exactly. they're like. You know, let, let's calculate the optimal candidate using the Nate Silver algorithm. Like, fuck you. You don't like you don't get it. It's a, a total 100 a percent agreement on that. Yes. So, OK, so what happens? What 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 happened? What? Because it, it, it kind of went out with a whimper and not a bang. Mm-hmm. The, the yay campaign. Yeah. What what happened? Did he lose his nerve? Did he. Did, was it just impossible to raise money or what what happened? Well, it was um, it was honestly a series of things. So the timeline, at least with my involvement, as I got out there, 
on November 17th. This is after the DEF CON tweet and the Tucker Carlson mm-hmm. thing. So I got out there November 17th. The dinner was on the 22nd. Tim Pool was one year ago today, so November 29th. Mm-hmm. And um, the Alex Jones thing, I think, was the week after. So by the time of the Alex Jones, so after Alex Jones, he got banned on Twitter. He did the Alex Jones thing. And there was this sort of like this, um, I don't want to use this word, maybe it's this insensitive, but there was sort of this like, re- he was really feeling himself. Very, I almost want to say manic, but I, you know, mm-hmm. I know he wouldn't like that word. But so like we do the Alex Jones thing and he loved it. And we jump on the jet, we fly to Miami and we meet with this guy and then we're driving a hundred miles an hour in a Tesla down from actually it was in Boca. We drove from Boca to Miami and he's blasting his songs. You know, why does it, this fucking thing go louder? We're, we're blasting, pick us up. You know, I'm telling him songs. He's making videos and posting them. And then he posted the swastika and then he got banned. And, you know, so a- after that, it became really difficult because basically the reality began to set in. And, you know, the thing that I love about Ye which he's truly able to do, and most people are not able to do this, is he has a sort of like unrealistic opinion of the world. You know, we, mm-hmm. he'd be like, well, we want to run the campaign and not take donations. We want to run the campaign and do no social media. Kind of like this magical thinking, which you need to be creative in any yeah. pursuit. Um, but at the same time, you know, reality has a way of reasserting itself. And so there, there is a fine line with these sort of imaginative, unrealistic, magical thinking, but also then it does tend to crash on the rocks of reality. And that is sort of what happened because his well, money was tied up. He, he couldn't find any lawyer to represent him because of what happened. I mean, literally wow. couldn't find a single lawyer. And so the money was running out, had no representation, had no social media. Like it, it was, it was really bad. He was in the maximum pressure, maximum sanction situation. Um, and it just kind of became difficult to move on. Like the, we couldn't work out of the office anymore. And he had fired the entire team except, I mean, he literally fired everybody except for me. And, uh, like I said, no lawyer running out of money. And, um, and then he got married. Then he got married uh, because the girl, you know, in that song, he says uh, he released a song after the Alex Jones thing, and he actually couldn't even publish it. The the Donny Hathaway estate, he sampled the Donny Hathaway song after the Alex Jones interview, and the Donny Hathaway estate wouldn't clear, clear the, the song. They yeah. wouldn't publish it on the streaming services because of what happened on Alex Jones. So he yeah. couldn't even put out a song. And anyway, in the song... He said, uh, wake up to an I can't do this anymore text. After the Alex Jones thing, his girl texted him and said, I can't do this anymore. And he had to win her back and everything. And anyway, they got married. And basically, after he got married, I didn't see him again for a long time. Marriage is overrated. And and by January, (laughs) he was telling me, you know, I I think actually maybe we'll just do a change of plans. Run for a different office. Run another time. Now, me... Hmm. I, tr- th- I was in a position where I was sort of more. the last man standing. Yeah. I was the only guy left Tough, on the political you know. team. I said, I, I have some resources at my disposal and I have, you know, a Rolodex here and I have the connection with him. I said, I'm going to move heaven and earth if possible to make it happen. And mm-hmm. that way I have no regrets. That way I can't look back and say, if only I tried harder, you know, yay could have been the president. So I really did try to make it happen, but you know, you get it. Uh, they put maximum pressure and it's difficult to move And any, you can't move like you can when you're not canceled. And, um, so, I mean, I, I put some meetings together we interviewed campaign managers and we built a website and everything. Um, and I, I saw him again once or twice after, uh, in this year in 2023. And then, uh, in May he left the country and, that was that. I mean, we had some, even in April and May, we were working on a website and it was going really well. Milo jumped back in and f- fucked up a lot. It caused like just a lot of drama. And then mm. Yay left the country. And then that was that. You know, what's really funny though, is um, <laughs> so me and Milo, we got into it over the, uh, in the group text, you know, because Milo got fired in like December and I basically caused that. 
And, you know, Milo found out because I bragged about it and he lost his mind. He came back for a vengeance and he tried to force me out, but Ye didn't want that. And so me and Milo got in this biblical fight on the group text <laughs> and, yeah, and me and him are going back and forth, you know, just ripping each other a new asshole in mm-hmm. front of in front of Ye and the CEO of Yeezy and Bianca and like the whole, the whole oh, crew, wow. the whole fucking company. Me and him are going out in the group text. And by the end of it, Ye, after like three hours after the dust settles, he goes, thank you both. That was very entertaining. And he goes around <laughs> and says he wanted to do a reality Milo, show I know you're like watching. me and Milo and the crew. So oh, that would be something. He, and he's like Trump in that regard. He likes when people fight it out. He likes to play people yeah. against each other and, you know, get that kind of court intrigue. Anyway, so that was a fun little tidbit. Yeah. But that's what happened. So I, I presume Milo, that's any sort of bridge has been burnt to smithereens, I would, I would imagine. At this point. Me and Milo? Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Well, what, what do you... I don't even know if I want to talk 1, about 1,000 live across all platforms maybe I'll just, on the kill stream. Maybe there are other better things to talk about. He's just a really evil sociopath in my yeah. humble opinion. Yeah, he's an odious human being. I mean, just like... Well, you know what's yeah. funny? Stop he brought content, people into the campaign yeah. uh, what to are replace saying, like, what are you? other people that were there, and then they all turned right. on him because he was stealing. They all flipped on him because he was so corrupt and so like such a yeah. piece of shit. The people that he brought in to try and screw me turned on him. So, you know, but that's the story. He's like a gypsy. I say this. I'm, I tell everybody. He you know, still he's works like this for Ye, by the way. Milo. I'm sure you have yeah. had the experience. Not all Jews are like this, but there is an archetype of like the, the Jew battle, gypsy man. archetype where they just yeah. sort of, they literally are wanderers. They're like nomadic scammers and they sort of go from patron to patron with a grift or a scam. And, and it's literally like when that grift is up, they flee town, they find a new patron and, and he's very, you know, so yeah. Yeah. That's, that's uh, uh, someone mentioned Patrick Casey as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it is <laughs> funny. I, uh, cause I, um, I, I remember talking about that, that issue with, with Joe Rogan where Milo was, basically justifying like being raped by a priest as a young boy. And, the, and, and you know, I, I didn't say anything that I don't think anyone else said. I, I just basically said like, th- this is not funny and mm-hmm. you're not joking in fact. And mm-hmm. so yeah. I, you know, no, that please. was it, but he, he seemed to have it out for me. Um, he was just waiting with his dagger. And then, you know, there's the, uh, the now, uh, legendary rant to, to end all rants which i love we all love them by the way. <laughs> well okay uh, <laughs> i'm glad you liked it uh, <laughs> uh someone did not me uh i mean look it is what it is i mean you know it's like i i guess it's it's now kind of over where it, it, it's like look everyone has really bad moments right and that was in a, a time of extreme pressure and i was just like Fuck it, we're doing this. No, you know, yeah. and I, you know, that's what it was. It was nothing more than that, in fact. Um, but anyway, for him to kind of like wait a, two years to like finally, like you know, get me with this, uh, uh, ooh, you're dealing with a bad person because I think with most healthy people, at some point you, you get over things, you know. Mm-hmm. Like you, you've said shit about me. I've said shit about you. At some point, it's just like. Milo you know, got you good, Spencer. Yeah, time moves forward. You know that's and for for a sociopath like that, I don't think they ever get over it. But anyway, that's well, that's more you know, than the, I the dissident right is full of sort of despicable characters. But I mean, that guy <laughs> takes the cake. He, yeah, he's sort of explicitly and proudly just a yeah, an waits, evil uh, Machiavellian the most conniving, it's like the openly, only way to do it. a terrible person who's bragging about you know having all this. Uh, uh, damning material on people and he's going to release it. It's just like, who the fuck is this guy? You know? Yeah. I, mean, I don't even, I think even on the kill it's, stream, giving, it's the giving him too much credit to yes, say he's evil. I think he's unwell. I think he's an unwell sort of mm-hmm. sick person. And you know, I, I actually became close with him for a period of a couple of years. You know, we were friendly. And, uh, and what I saw was just a sort of pathetic, sad person, you know, like a very superficial person broke, um, and and constantly needing um, to sort of like buy people's affection or like mm. you know th- this is a this is clearly a um, oh, broke, a deeply wounded person 
from a very early time. And what I notice is that he was somebody who, you know, like me, I, I feel like I'm, I'm Italian. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm like, you know, what you see is what you get. If you like it, I like you. If you don't, fuck you. You know, I don't care. Mm-hmm. And with him, it was always trying to like earn trust or earn friendship through this persona, this very affected persona of I'm rich. Oh, I don't care about anything. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm edgy. And it's a very juvenile thing. It's very like fucking high school energy. But, you know, people that have trauma early on, they sort of never get over that, never mature emotionally. And so it's mm-hmm. always like, and even with the yay thing, that was something that he saw. And this is also speaks to the sort of psychopathy. He saw that as something that I wanted, something that I sort of coveted because we saw at that time that yay was trending that way. And, you know, the, the, how I got yay's number is I went through Alex Jones uh, producer, but she doesn't like me. Alex Jones producer has not liked me for years, which is whatever. <laughs> but I knew she had mm-hmm. the number because she's a fan of Owen Benjamin and yay said something that he knew Owen and Alex. So I said, Oh, she must have the number. She hates me. I know Milo has a relationship with her. So I said, Hey Milo, could you get that number? And so Milo developed this and got the number. And once he had that, he sort of used it because I coveted that to try and gain control over me and try to sort of get me to kneel and put me in this sort of collection of, (laughs) Yeah. You know, of instruments, uh, of people that can be used, because I think that's sort of what defines a psychopath is is instrumentalizing people for your own ends. And oh, yeah. um, and and really what caused the tension on the team is that I would go out there and I was kind of like, no, like, I'm not going to be I'm not here to be your slave. And I, I don't I, you don't Imagine own me because doing you did me that. this favor or anything. <laughs> but he business. didn't see it that way. He saw it as, you know, I did this favor for you. Now you have to do whatever I did. Now I own you and whatever. And there was a moment when he was like, well, you know, I'll get you, I'll send you home. I'll get you fired. And I said, fuck you. I'll buy the ticket myself. You think I need this? I don't need this. I'm an independent person, whatever. Um, Funny but, but that was really sent the cause $3. Their the enemies are only sociopaths I, you know, when they win. Anyway, but that bunch of bitter queens sort of mad that they got out the flat. Milo buys favors and has maintained it's, it's influence through backroom dealings. Like, uh, Why? That evil, sounds like politics. An evil, figure. It's actually very this? sad. Bruh you know, small person well, that, that turns into mm-hmm. this. And I yeah, remember, say it's fucked up, you know, that's how it works. You know, I've seen him sort of thrashing around. What it is. You know, He's done similar. Look, and, uh, and attacking Nick me. Nick does the like, exact this same is shit. This it's a nasty business, as always say. Straight in politics, all this like, shit. Can we give this person a friend? Like, can this be a they person? They brought up Patrick yeah. Casey. Look what he did to Patrick. Yeah. But obviously, the truth. I'm going to be avoided at all costs. But, I mean, I got a lot of use. Ironically, I got a lot of use out of him. I sort of. Maybe you maybe got the most path. use out of him. Yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Uh, let's do this. I, I there were a couple other topics that I was interested in, but we have we actually maxed out our capacity for um, uh, <laughs> listeners. First time we've done that. Uh, I think we know the reason for that. Um, does if you have a the question for Nick, um, you can raise your hand and then I can call on you. Um, I will. Uh, I'll just look here to see who we have. All right, Steve C., you're up first. Hey, Nick. Big fan. Hey. Sorry, I, I wasn't expecting this at all. I just, just raised my hand. Um, but just I'll just say, you know, you guys um, have been a great influence on my life, you know, just listening to you, you guys. And Nick, you brought me to back to church. Um, you know, after 10 years of being away. So, and, you know, Richard, especially more recently, I've been listening to your, your talks and your rants um, just about, this you know, pan Europeanism and mm-hmm. that type of thing. And I, I think that's a really good thing for, uh, for this movement in general. So uh, I just want to say thank you guys. I know your work sometimes goes unappreciated. So thank you very much. And thank you for having this talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's go to yeah. Let's go to Paul O R Paul Or. Guys, um, question to you both: Do you feel that after World War II, the unipolar world we've lived in, has the unipolar power been the United States, or has it actually been Israel? Press and if we'll hear an end dropped. Uh, after nineteen forty-five. Yeah, post World War II, and for hopeful anyway. Well, I would say post World <laughs> War II, we definitely had a bipolar world. Um, so, I mean, the Soviet Union 
by the let's say the 60s if i call in when they kick I me i won't be able to broadcast the Soviet it. union wasn't going to overwhelm the united states with yeah, production or something yeah. and in fact it was very behind by and the they don't 70s, know what my handle is i create clear. a whole new account um but it, it also had Maybe a tremendous amount of legitimacy end. i mean the new left started leaving them by the late 60s but you still would look to moscow for as a I'm not a doing a garage. Of, they'll you kick know, they're, me. They're leading Genius. the world. They're they're moving forward. <laughs> At the very least, you would fear Moscow due to nuclear weapons. I, like so I think it was definitely uh, a bipolar world. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Crowdhammer is correct. Uh, after the That'd fall of the Soviet though. Union, it mind. wasn't like the United States controlled everything or anything like that. But they it, it, there was no other competing vision. Yeah, they think and they I actually it out, like, think really. there still is no other competing vision. I mean, I'm I've heard, I, I'll hear some some of these highlights of like Jackson Hinkle and th he's like, you know, people hate America. We're turning to Russia. For it's like, listen, what are you talking about? I mean, th there's I I don't discount Russia, but the idea that there's a a vision for how a, a, for how to do things and how you want to live, where you're getting your culture from, I I still don't think there is a a huge amount of competition. Now, I mean. I, I know a lot of white nationalists, yes, et cetera, want to say, you know, Zionist occupied government, et cetera. I mean, look, getting Israel was was iffy all the way through. I mean, Herzl was going to Kaiser Wilhelm, going to the Rothschild family, writing books. And I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't like a dominant force just placed it. And there's no doubt that it had tremendous influence etc. There's no doubt that it was the, the fact that Herzl was even having conversations with the Rothschild family shows that it has tremendous influence. But I I don't think that we live in a like Zionist occupied world or or it's like a, a una unipolar power. I mean, I think it it does need America to survive. Period. End of statement. And so in that sense, it's not hegemonic. Nick now, watching does it have free tremendous influence through like Richard was mad and we have Hollywood, super chats and then we talk to be frank. Well, go pay Richard Spencer and you can do uh, it that way. I'm from I mean, right. No yeah. doubt. No doubt. Cheap but it, it still is it's a free trial. It, and I think too. this is something very dumb? typical of Jews in general and, and Zionism in particular. It it exists within a power structure and it can have tremendous influence. It can, can, can control it, at least seemingly. But it's not it's it's not really the alpha. It 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 can't exist without Thank you, funny us. Valentine. And I think some of the a lot of white nationalists get into this, you Speaking know, super Jews chance. control everything. I'm not saying this to be like politically correct or something. I'm saying it to be accurate. Is it gonna say it? What? You can you know respond yeah. to that. <clears throat> or, yeah. Well, yeah, certainly not after World not? War II. And, and you're right, it's a bipolar world order and and Israel doesn't have the same dominance I'll over it in a second the State Department. Play. And you really see it's in the 60s and 70s when the names start to change. When you look at like the Carnegie Endowment and the CFR, and the, there's a very clear transition from Anglo names to Jewish names around the mm -hmm. 70s. Um, and, and of course, even Eisenhower and Kennedy were more resistant to Israel than Johnson and future presidents. Um, so, so the two premises are wrong. One, it's a bipolar world order. Two, America wasn't dominated by the Zionists. Until <laughs> Nobody later. on Cozy's restreaming and, uh, it. Yeah, because he told them not to. They're not a pole because yeah. they they cannot they're project cucked. power on a global Sad. scale like the United States can. They can. The United States is the pole. They just influence it. Um, but they're not a pole. Yeah. Yeah, I think Spencer should make it. Yeah, and I again, too, I think we're I about think to see about another Make more money. episode yeah. in the Jewish story. How and, many people do you think um, are actually paying for I, I don't know. I guarantee you a lot what, of what groupers there? paid them. You know, David's kingdom lasted 80 for years and went into decline. I, I, That's nuts. You probably figured I, I don't, keep a percentage I, of the sub. I, I mean, I think I, the answer yeah, is, go it ahead. Makes, it go yeah, ahead. The answer yeah. is that they yeah. became powerful and became dominant in the country, evidently, right? But um, yeah, the, their power seems to be on the wane. I mean, Kind of yeah. obviously. Yes. I mean, Hello to the Garpers you know, that are watching. And, uh, I've been there's trying a lot to be of nice recently too. Again, Why are you guys even mad at me? Some of these big players like Trump and <laughs> Musk have contributed to their decline. There's no question about They're it. Just happy. They even just if kind of like. Oh, no, they miss me. I know. Um, it's so yeah. boring so on cozy without your boy. I know. I, you know, I, I think that they're still very powerful uh, players in in uh, the world in this country and in the world, but um, they've been humbled to some extent, and uh, mm -hmm. and. 
I would have to guess that that trend Nobody cares about this continue. guy. Let's try. I don't see it reversing. Let's see if it'll play this um, song. I think kind of the cat is out of the bag. I think it, it won't um, play it. You know what? I'll just read it. White nationalist. Ralph on the up and up um, while these morons are down bad. People it, um, know they bear uh, witness. I mean, Viva I mean, la Killstream. Hail to the Ralph Amel. I think that, again, <laughs> Musk's, I think that it does seem likely that Trump will be. Okay, cut. He cut. Oh, as, no. Um, as, um, as, as both uh, Richard. As I, I think that Trump will be the, the next president, as both Richard and Nick are predicting. Do you think he'll throw them a bomb? I think that like again that stream. Musk pl will play a critical role in that. It's dire I mean, not just there. having changed the climate, but now, you know, now uh, a, a kind of free Twitter that will invite Trump back on just it creates a kind of clear road for him. And I think that um, I don't know that we'll see the sort of same kind of crazy zeal tree um, that we saw in 2016. Uh, in a way, I mean. You guys were talking about, yeah, you need this sort of passion. There's not even 300 viewers uh, right now. Messianic <laughs> energy uh, to get mm -hmm. Trump back in. And I think that that's present, but I think it's it's matured. This I think people worse become than me and I'm in Mexico. And more sort of cynical. And there's, there's kind of maturation. As much as it's kind of boomer and it's not totally what we love and it's, there is a kind of inherent conservatism to it, it seems more assured and more like, okay, we know the score now. This what is if not Boneface joined this panel? And hmm. uh, we're going to put Trump That'd back in nice. office. And uh, so there, <laughs> I think there'll be less wildness. I want to hear what Bob is going to say. There will be a stronger kind of robust, more mature and assured movement behind Trump this time, is my sense, you know? I agree with you to some extent. I, I definitely think that many people within MAGA uh, have understood that they lost the Trump administration. That'd be with sick. The if Ballface came on, I'd And Huge. in those three months that Huge you have after time. winning the election, you need to just appoint the bureaucracy of loyalists. And I think they're going to do this. You know, a lot of people say things like, no one will work for him and 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 whatever. That, that just means that you won't work for him, the person saying that. <laughs> there are thousands of people in this country who might not be as couth as... You know, people press B if you want Boneface back, but they're smart. They got a law degree. They can do this. They're, you know, the guy like that Oklahoma senator who was like an MMA fighter who challenged someone on on the to fight on the floor. I mean, they, they're more like him, but it doesn't actually See, mean that they're Boneface. necessarily <laughs> less intelligent. Um, <laughs> it might mean that they have been they don't the have really around, basically. Yeah. yeah, the people he should have enlisted the first. Are you time seeing around, that, Chief? Definitely. Um, but he didn't. And, and but they they've stayed true to them. So I think there actually will be plenty of people. You just don't you've never heard their names because their name is Buck and they live in Oklahoma, you know. But it, it, again, I, I say this as a compliment. I, it's not like they're less intelligent than the guy who, you know, has a master's degree from um, uh, Harvard or something. So um, but yeah, I, I think they will appoint that. And I think there's going to be a lot of vengeance. I'm I'm not sure there's going to be any policy vision. Um, but I think there's going to be the bees a have lot it. of uh, vengeance. So yeah, it's, it's an ocean of bees out there. Um, Alberto, do you want to jump in? I'll just go right down. In Alberto, order. um, you got a question? Or Michael comment? Alberto? Alberto? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you can hear me, right? That would have been sick. You're kind of roboting, but try it. Okay. Uh, sorry. There I, you I'm, go. I just got new internet set up. But uh, this is a question for uh, both Richard, Mark, and Nick. Uh, just generally speaking, what do you think I got of uh, Americans for prosperity I it was backing him at first, this idiot not... Nikki Birdbrain Haley uh, for president? Um, pretty stupid pick, I'd say, by a libertarian. Also, Nick but doesn't take calls what do you guys anytime think of that? or anymore. So, uh, big fan of both. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. Yeah, yeah he refuses. To take calls. <clears throat> well, it's not surprising. Um, bad. Well, I think it's uh, they're coalescing behind her, and uh, oh, they're they're that? going for South Carolina. Oh, I actually heard this from Charlie Kirk. What I think he's right hell? about this um, <clears throat> that uh, Trump's going to win Iowa. He's going to win New Hampshire, but South Carolina is her home state, and that's the first mm. one of the first four. And uh, and same thing happened with Biden in the twenty twenty primary. If you remember that he he really struggled in Iowa, New Hampshire, and Nevada. Uh, but it was South Carolina that put him over the top and put him on track. And so some are saying that she has That's sort true. of been anointed. They're saying DeSantis isn't, it's not going to be him. So they're coalescing around her. And, um, you know, it's funny well, about America's prosperity. I actually know the uh, guy that runs it 
his son and I have beef going back a long time. Cabot Phillips, his father, he's with, with campus reform. I think he's with Turning Point now, but his father runs that outfit. And they're with, um, uh, they met at the Leadership Institute. Him, his father and mother met at Morton Blackwell's Leadership Institute. So it's no surprise. It's not surprising at all. It's conservative establishment stuff. Um, well, they're also, they're just going to continue to try to defeat Trump with one of these people like they're, right. they they would have liked they they probably would have preferred DeSantis and things like that. But mm-hmm. it's they're now going with Nikki Haley. Um, yeah, it's just not going to win. There, there's just no there's no point to it. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. Ateus. You're up. Uh, yeah. Um, hey, Nick. Uh, you know, I really appreciate, you know, that you're one of the few that can see through, you know, all the Jewish ops um, for all the silly insults you get about your sexuality. You do have an uncanny ability to see past all like the nude bodybuilder posting, targeting the, you know, the young and feeble minded on Twitter. So that's actually pretty refreshing. <laughs> and it's nice that you can see the the long game. You know, not many people can do that. Um, I'm specifically talking about the, um, you know, when everyone wanted to respond to all the dog whistles that were going on about the anti-Muslim uh, kind of rhetoric you saw from characters like Ben Shapiro. You know, it was nice to see that there was someone on Twitter who was able to, you know, kind of hold their ground and to see that it was a golden opportunity to kind of dogpile on Israel. So, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that there's someone out there that can do that. Um, we do have, I mean, speaking personally, we have disagreements about like Christianity and stuff. And I think that's a pretty big topic to get into. But uh, just to quickly just leave it there, I was, just wanted to say that, you um, you know, there's a lot of things we could disagree about, but I think that there's a lot in common too. So that's all. Nice. Yeah. yeah well, stuff. thanks. <clears throat> Backhanded compliment. They wanted yeah, to basically get <laughs> white nationalists on board. Yeah, there are quite a few in there. They, it yeah. was all you sneak 2000. This there, you know, yeah. it, it's very funny, actually. A, a number of us were hanging out here in Montana um, uh, in, in August, and we went to this honky tonk uh, eff- effectively that's, that's, you know, a mile down the road. And in and all the people were singing like the songs of their youth or something in karaoke. There are a lot of I uh, people can attest here. There, it was remarkable how good looking the women were. A lot of you know cut off jeans and tank tops. It was remarkable. Um, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, um, fashy mama can attest. Um, IRL girls, not e girls. Right? Yeah, no e girls. No, no, no <laughs> one there was <laughs> no e girls. Yeah, flesh. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So they were singing karaoke and they're singing all the songs of their youth. And so there are all these guys singing these like Bush era anthems. And I don't even remember them, but it was actually just kind of crazy. Like, you know, we're going to throw a grenade in your hijab and we're going to throw you back to Arabia because like we'll string you up on a rope. I mean, it, I was just they were singing all this like Bush era stuff and we were like, we lived through fascism and we like we weren't even aware of it and i was like criticizing I, I mean, it was just it was kind of a weird uh phenomenon but they wanted well, it's to just a that. testament to how sissy things have gotten since is probably true really yeah there, right? but it is it is it definitely is but i i anyway um they wanted to do that again with israel and i think actually yeah. um most people who are serious just spat it back in their face. They're like, mm-hmm. I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna attack the Palestinians for being Islamo fascist. You know, fuck you. Yeah. If <laughs> any people deserve some sort of sympathy, it's them. For God's sake, they're not a bunch of theocratic Nazis. I mean, what the fuck are you talking about? I think smart people were just like, no, we're not doing it. And they actually had to go to other tax, but I think they really wanted to do that after October seventh. It's like let's just fire them up, you know, red meat, Muslim bashing. You're you're free to bash the Muslims, guys. You got the you know the M card is is yours, and and people didn't buy it. The kosher the kosher yeah. bigotry, yeah, yeah. Well, and they were doing it in uh, the dissident and right space with all those Bronze Age pervert guys, and it's so, it's so transparent. Just this, uh, you know. Well, hey, guys, uh, that's not really our fight, but there's Muslims over here. And I pointed out the contradiction that, you know, all of that notwithstanding, what do you think happens when Israel annexes Gaza? Where do you think those people are coming? You know, people tried to pivot and pander to (laughs) nativists and make it about immigration. They said, oh, well, we're isolationists now. This is a domestic problem, and the domestic problem is the Muslim protesters. 
hey, genius, who do you think's coming here after Israel's done with their war? Like, we've all seen how the story ends every single time. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally agree. And I'm, I go so autistic about that on Twitter and on my show with these people. This Because there is clearly a network, that Bronze Age pervert crowd. They're all Jews. They're all Zionists. And that has been a thing in the white nationalist circle for a while. Like, clearly there are some white nationalists that, Right. They roll with Jews. Like some Jews support white nationalism. Mm-hmm. And, Over uh, 1,000 like lives. It is what it is. So I think you have to. I, I think you have to demonstrate that. I would love that to have Bronze Age pervert on the show, face. actually. Because <laughs> otherwise Jarvin you're just playing night. some little game. You know, like you'll let us attack Muslims yeah. and blacks. Or something. Right. You know, well, thanks. You know, we can do that now. <laughs> oh, good. You know, and and, and first right. off, I, I think I probably speak for you, too. Is I, I'm kind of over this, like black crime or what you know it's like Mm -hmm. guys let's talk about something (laughs) let's talk let's talk about something that's interesting i mean it's just to to dwell on like people who are misbehaving just to like be the hall monitor of the african-american community i mean (laughs) yeah i mean just it's i'm i'm done just dwelling on something we've all known forever did you know blacks commit crime no yes (laughs) i I never heard that before wow (laughs) Right. Rediscovering ancient stereotypes like they're real. <laughs> it's true. Right. Um, OK, Alex's iPhone. I hope this isn't my son. Uh, go on. It's... <laughs> OK. <laughs> I was just wondering, uh, what's your perspective on AI during wartime? Um, hmm. Specifically about photographs. You know, I'm sure That's a pretty that good question. everyone I here has seen too. pictures that were not real. And that we thought were real, everyone here. I mean, I'm sure of it. And um, I just wanted to get Nick's perspective on that. I mean, I've heard yours, Richard. So yeah, uh, sure. Just yeah. Well, I'm I'm sure it's legitimate, but you know what? I don't think it's really that much different because I feel like you know there's there's all kinds of atrocity propaganda that precedes AI, and it's in the medium of that day. You know, the medium today is digital imagery and now we have sophisticated tools that can forge that and i don't think it's any different than you know the difference is that it's more compelling anyone can look at it and say oh you know there it is seeing is Mm -hmm. believing but uh fundamentally i don't think it's anything new before that there were rumors now there's this so yeah i think that's true i i think there's definitely i mean i've said this before but i i think we someone serious in leadership needs to address this because like the potential, I've just m- mentioned this as an example, the potential of an AI image of Vladimir Putin saying, I have just sent a nuclear weapon to Warsaw or something like, <laughs> again, that could be debunked in 30 minutes. Mo- half of the people won't it believe be that it's debunked. That. Half of p- people will, uh, you know, act as if it's <laughs> it better real. be I mean, a it, lot faster than I don't that. Know. There, there's, are From the kidding? Biden administration, there's just North been some 34, like, happy talk about $3 AI. On and, like, we want to back with AI innovative. kill test two Make babies. Sure that it's the equal distribution, <laughs> of the power of AI. Thank it, you, North. Like this is this <laughs> thing we're dealing with is really. It better be faster than thirty minutes, Rich. Uh, I, gotta I would say. say overall awful and destructive. Like we, we're, this is let's not just let Silicon Valley go play around or something. It needs this, to this be like three minutes serious. max. Um. Uh, anyway, Hunkle, go for it. <clears throat> Yo, what's up, uh, Nick? Uh, yeah. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I know that you're a big McDonald's fan. And you're a big hmm. fan of the Big Macs. I was wondering, um, as you've matured and aged and you've tried new burgers, um, <laughs> what what would you say is your about. favorite burger right now? Uh, if he doesn't have the spirit. Great question. Um, <clears throat> um Favorite burger? I mean, Please honestly, California has the best burgers. Uh, I'm see, from Chicago. We if don't he have had Spencer Spill memorized, that would have been the funniest thing them. ever. Yeah. Hot dogs, yeah. We have more hot dog yeah. stands than so we have McDonald's that. that these KFC put yeah. together. If he could have just recited Spencer Spill, I can't do it either just from memory, it. honestly. Just say it. But if he could have just said Swiss. it. Swiss. Yeah. Roasted mushrooms, caramelized onions. <laughs> yeah. Where can you find it? A number of different places. At a number of places. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> that was good. That was... But we love that. I mean, you did the yeah. impression of me earlier. Like, we're, we're even now. <laughs> it's good stuff. That's good. Um, yeah. <laughs> hot stuff. Yeah. That's hot stuff, yeah. There we go. <laughs> 
Uh, all right, N, you're up. Uh-oh, we did get an end drop. Hi, so maybe shifting the topic of conversation to something a little bit heavier, if that's all right. Um, so if we could spend a little time talking about religion. Um, so I wouldn't ask either of you to debate your personal faith, uh, but rather the utility of Christianity in accomplishing your political goals. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that you have, that, that maybe this is the biggest point of distinction between both of you, uh, with Richard viewing Christianity as an obstacle to accomplishing those goals, Nick um, obviously viewing them instead as necessary and even essential. Um, so perhaps if both of you could comment on that and maybe try to reconcile it. Anglin's going to be pissed because he, he said I was Anglin. Yeah, well, um, the yeah. thing is, I mean, so I watched. Also, the, if the not for me, actually, it would just be I on his sub stack. And I saw mm -hmm. you talk with Destiny on Adam 22. And the thing, what's interesting is I talked to Destiny. I sort of realized that the fundamental difference between us is that he's not religious. So not even really that he's a leftist. It's that he's sort of a materialist. And what's interesting, as a result of some of those conversations, he said that on the left, they need to develop. Uh, now, I don't think he's actually that smart. I mean, I've kind of been on this crusade to prove that he's pretty dumb, actually, and doesn't know anything. Um, but he goes to his fans. If, if I could say, just well, jump in real quick. He, sure. he's an he's an internet i, it, I don't I, I met him per perfectly nice like I, I don't have any personal animosity or anything he he's just he's like an internet person where there's I try no to set up spencer and destiny and spencer it. it's just kind of like i want to just win like it's like a i want it's like basketball like i want to just score layup like get a point and you know debate's not really uh, debate at its best isn't about that it's actually about like coming to a deeper conclusion like uh, common ground and and kind of honing yourself by by slamming up against you know ideas kind of confronting one another and i think he's he's like a product of his medium which is twitch i think spencer just doesn't just like, like destiny though what you're saying now though kind of getting in arguments almost like debate club or something so i say that as a constructive criticism i hope he actually reads a book and learns which <laughs> language the bible was written in <laughs> No, I tell you, yeah, and I name, absolutely agree. I think he's totally unimpressive in that Agreed, regard. Uh, and it's blown me away, the yeah. things he just doesn't know. And and it's yeah. like you say, there are things anyone would know if there was any real curiosity or any real engagement with what's happening. Yeah. I mean, like people, his his uh, fans say, Yeah, the New Testament's you know, great. Oh, you're getting nice. on him because he doesn't know where Virginia is on a map. It's like, okay, but it's not it's that if he even cared, if yeah, it was actually Testament about that, for him, it, and the old it, it would be impossible not to Hebrew, not Hebrew to yeah. So it wasn't Aramaic, Aramaic, interested, Aramaic but, it was Hebrew for the old. Um, well, I got half anyway, of it right. So with him, he tells his followers, well, what we need with the uh, liberalism is an overarching idea, something bigger than ourselves that provides meaning and all these things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the Nietzscheans have sort of that same thing. You know, they talk about like Bronte, Pervert, and you, I mean, you're very different, but you're also mm. both trying to come up with what's that, you know, Apollonianism, I think is what you guys yeah, are about. Yeah. He's about something else. Aramaic, Greek, um, and Hebrew. But with me, I feel like now, yeah, so right. I, am, I, mean, I do believe in God. There, so I was right. That you, Perish, you fucking dumb Aramaic. fuck. Blow your brains out, please, in chat. The liberals are trying to overcome <laughs> is the sort of self-generation of belief which makes it not true belief. You know, it's like in Inception when they say it's impossible to fake true inspiration. It's impossible mm -hmm. to sort of fabricate that feeling. Um, if we say that we're doing a religion because of its effects, because of its products, you know, it, you actually, con you'll never get those products because it's, then it's not religion because then it's a sort of self-conscious imitation of religion or self-conscious uh, self imitation of belief. It's not true belief. And I think that it's impossible to replicate with anything else because it's not real. Um, you I know, Apollo so today. It's not fuck? a real. I don't know. I don't think you believe that. I don't. He's not a real. Yeah, person. that's a side He's not a real supernatural show. entity. <laughs> he's not a, extrinsic to mankind or the universe, and therefore we can't give our lives to that. We There's can't. No you know, and it, it really becomes. It's almost the same thing like with political sovereignty. You know, Schmidt says what distinguishes yeah, a sovereign like is he can today. take life you know you can order people <laughs> oh, to go kill and be killed no. similarly i feel like the effect again. of religion only down works if you're willing to die or... or kill for it because it's transcendent it's, it's, it's actually to really to transcendent it really and i don't is. think that's the case it with is. any kind of overman archetype or something like that uh it right. becomes a lark so what do you you definitely you believe that jesus walked the earth yeah I believe as a, he was a real person but also incarnated god Yes. Okay. Uh, so, but in what, 
in what other way is religion real? Like, is it is it real because there are and something I would, of course, not dispute, which is that there are millions of people sincerely believe it and are, and are motivated. Does that is that kind of part of the reality the a Holy Spirit, you know, if yeah. you will? OK, yeah, the Holy Spirit binding everyone together. Right. Um, OK, Mark, do you want to I don't want to get too testy about this issue, but yeah, I, I don't yeah. either. I'm kind of enjoying it. <laughs> oh, so it's Mark so. Brahman. He's yeah. been on the show. <laughs> I think that Nick actually I mean, we do appreciate a lot of the stuff you do. Uh, in, in what we would probably call the secular realm of politics, I didn't know that's maybe you don't make that distinction, but um, and but that's fine. But we think, uh, but we think that um, you know, some of your political activism is useful, and we think that you're a smart guy, you're funny. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, but you, you know, no, feel free, feel free. I'm not going to take it personal. You don't need the oh no the preamble just okay. you can just yeah, yeah. <laughs> give it to me straight right. but i hate your guts All right. well, no, no. <laughs> yeah. but i don't i mean some people there is a kind of emotionalism of course with religion so yeah you know and you know the things that you're not supposed to talk about are religion and politics of course we're talking about politics but you know we thought that we we want to be um friendly to our guests of course mm-hmm. um but yeah no i mean i i would say that um really i i mean i think that there's no question that Christianity has the power to bind people and motivate people in a direction. I think that uh, the thing that we question is what is that direction, right? So we're not convinced that that direction is toward a, a racialist or nationalist goal. Uh, we think that it's not toward a racialist or nationalist goal. But um, uh, so in, in and I think that uh, but in, in I, I also believe in God too. By the way, I you, we, you might class my. Uh, belief in God is more deist, I think, is probably mm. might be a fair way of describing it. Um, Nick, uh, uh, or rather Richard, uh, now I can't make a distinction between you two. You've become so friendly. <laughs> <laughs> but Richard, uh, Richard, I think, is an atheist, or, or he, he might class himself as an atheist mm-hmm. or agnostic. I don't know. But I think that um, in Apollonians, I think, are allowed to be atheists. North 34, $34 and dollars on Rumble. Uh, for Sorry, Ralph. An Any chance too, getting a so break forth. form the faggot boy and Messiah? I think that, um, and can we stomp on you know, Kissinger again? Way, the way that we, we will, but we can't until it's over because everybody wants kind of maximum, so bride, I'm yeah, sorry. So in Nora. a way, it is kind of the opposite of the Christian goal. Whereas you, you, could, you could say, well, Christianity becomes a way of making people passionate, motivated, and uh, directed toward a transcend, transcendent goal. Uh I would argue that our, you know, so I guess in in a way there is this kind of deist aspect or influence to it, is that we're we're looking more for sobriety and reason and a kind of planning toward uh, goals that are earthly, um, but you know are also uh, involve an afterlife in the sense that we under uh, a kind of verifiable afterlife in the sense that we understand children, for example, to be a kind mm-hmm. of verifiable afterlife and so forth. Um, I don't, you know, the idea, the idea of an afterworld, I don't necessarily exclude that possibility. Um, but I think that we do, and Richard probably more adamantly excludes that possibility, but I think that um, we do see it as a way of kind of manipulating people to bad ends or, or ends that are oh, I already said people, already. <laughs> um, conducive to racial survival and so forth. Uh, you know, that's just our perspective or our opinion. But um, yeah, I, well, let me what, ask this, Nick, you know, in, in the sense of belief, like and I and I understand sincerity, uh, Christian sincerity. I absolutely understand it. And, you know, I do go to church. I I'm, I guess I'm very uh, conflicted in this uh, sense. Um, Sounds but, like <laughs> you know, when you when you see a work of art that expresses a, a, an ideal of a human form or human action, or even on, on a more down to earth way, when you're just passionately in love with a woman and just want to mm, take it in, aren't you, don't you in those senses kind of believe in God in the sense that you're in that intense experience, you're experiencing Venus. And in that, in in looking at maybe even a, a work of art, or maybe no even a great athlete, yeah, or, that, that might not or you just friend. see human at- intelligence in a <laughs> yeah. perfect form, you're, you you're experiencing the, the Apollonian in that sense. And in that sense, you believe. So I don't, I I don't think I I I, I get the kind of criticism of we're making it up, or we're, we're trying to revive Moirica. something, and you know what we believe in and is real. 
but I guess I would I would say that we're we're going for a a different kind of faith in the sense that we we want ideals for human behavior to exist. And when you're idolizing those ideals, you are in a way believing in them and experiencing them. You know, if you're in love, you know who Venus is. And if you read Shakespeare or just, you know, touched by it, you know who Apollo is, who's Apollo, Apollo god of uh, music and and other things, but also intelligence. You just know it. And and I, I think that's what we're trying to do is to create a, a form that we want to strive after. And um, and I, I actually, you know, to be fair, I, I think Jesus also does this in a way. It's it's about being like Jesus and and experiencing Him. And it, and in that sense, you have faith, not necessarily in in the sense in in the in the way that that you that word is used in in Christian context. Uh, yeah, but, well, I've know, never heard it explained that way. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh no, no. But to the caller's uh, question, I would say that I don't think it's necessary that we reconcile these things. Um, you know, I think that I certainly, I wouldn't, I'm not, I'm not trying to convert Nick or anything like that. I, I don't think Richard's trying to convert Nick. And mm -hmm. I don't think that if, if someone's instinct is to become a Christian, uh, I think that they should pursue that instinct, honestly, you know? And I think that that's, I'm a hundred percent fine with that. If someone is kind of like natively or instinctively a, a Christian, I think that they should pursue that. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I would what say, about, um, Nick, do you want to convert them? Uh, yeah, I mean, by definition, I want everyone <laughs> right. to be. I'm okay, not so going to try right. and, uh, this is here. <laughs> and we we take that as a compliment because we think we, we right. think that that comes from a good place from Nick. Mm -hmm. We don't doubt that. Yeah. Well, and and to your point though, Mark, I I actually agree with you, and I think there are some uh, as far as Christianity, and it's not if you're looking for a religion or a belief system that's designed to advance racialism, it really isn't. That wouldn't be the ideal one. Right. That wouldn't necessarily comport with that uh, or even any understanding of genetics, you know, because when you think about eugenics, this is a tough one for me, because on the one hand, you see that clearly genetics matter far more than anyone would like to admit. And there are good genetic practices and bad genetic practices. And they lead to good outcomes versus bad outcomes. And Christianity says, especially now, it, it is I don't want to say it's a problem, but you know, more people are living than ever before, very high mutational load, and you're getting sort of bad genetic effects. And, you know, as a Christian, it's like, well, you struggle for the answer because a secular person would say, oh, well, the answer is abortion or sterilization mm -hmm. or whatever. And we would say, well, that's immoral. And so, you know, I haven't thought too deeply about that, but it does present sort of a quandary. So I get, you know, where a racialist would come from on that. And I guess with regard to what you're saying, I get what you're saying. For me, this is just my experience growing up um, cause I agree with you about experiencing excellence or the ideal forms. And I'm, you know, not like a trained philosopher. I'm sure there's, You're not? you know, there's platonic ideas there, but also in Christianity, but I'll just say we, this. We, we like that about you, Nick, actually. We like that. We like your earthiness. <laughs> that you don't right? try to do yeah. philosophy. And we actually, like that you're not yes. pretentious and you don't think you're like Plato or some shit like that. We yeah. like okay, it. good. Yeah. Cause I feel like when I come in, cause I know Richard's educated. So I come in and I'm like. Hey, I'm just some guy, you know, but, um, <laughs> but at least from my experience, I just feel like without God, it doesn't matter. I Maybe this is a personality thing, but for me, without God, I wouldn't care about anything. Nick I would feel like country? nothing would matter. Nothing would govern my behavior. And yeah, I'm I didn't know if that was like... Excellence. Maybe that's... Now, don't yeah. get me wrong. Yeah. I would still have, you know, uh, either in, inherent or... Um, what's the word, sort of uh, ingrained behaviors or things like that. Uh, but I, I don't know that I would actually really fundamentally care. And, and so to me, that, and that's not an argument. I'm just saying for me, the obstacle for anything that is non-theistic or even anything that's Gnostic is if you don't believe in the reality of religion, the reality of an afterlife and a moral truth and an, a judgment, I just wouldn't even care. Um, and that, so anyway, that's just where I come from, but I, I never heard it said that way. And that's sort of interesting, I guess, Nick, uh, I, I'm, I always I'm, thought it's sort of like self-help, but what you're saying makes more sense. I'm sympathetic mm -hmm. to your perspective. And I think that that's one of the reasons that I believe in God. Like I believe that there's a purpose to my life. And I think that, that that's one of the things that you're getting at as far as the afterlife is concerned. Uh, you know, it's a very profound and weird or difficult question. I mean, it's not, I mean, we can't even really kind of conceive of an afterlife. Uh, what is an afterlife? Is, is it a is, is it all pleasure? 
if 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 you mm-hmm. live in a period that's all if you run on 7 p.m eastern pleasure, tomorrow night what is pleasure pleasure there's a kind of unity of opposites you know if there's no pain, mm-hmm. there's the pleasure, legendary no run and so forth so they're almost the legend they're almost, it's almost something literally beyond human uh not hyperbole I know Nick, um well, and, and Nick you know, worships him, so and I know Nick plugs what right, the UNS report you should every just try stream, to so. do. Yeah, you should try to lead the world a better place than you found it, and including though, especially for your offspring and uh, those related to you, um, and and so it the it's a philosophy of sort of ameliorating the world, I would say, because again, uh, your offspring are a kind of verifiable afterworld. You can say, okay, well, that is a real you know, not to be a materialist of flesh and blood afterworld. Uh, and so that you can, in that you have to kind of trust that, that that is real, that you don't live in a kind of illusion that God isn't like deceiving you by putting you in this weird, like sort of flesh material maze, but that it actually is relevant that you're here to do good in the world and that you do have a purpose because the chance of you existing at all is, is extreme. I mean, this is, this is, these are some of the reasons why I believe in God is that the chances of us existing at all are are, are tiny, are, are are ridiculously remote, you know? Um, you know, the fact that your sperm hit the egg and so forth, right? Uh, or that y- your sperm was released <laughs> to hit the egg at that time. It, like the probability is just kind of astronomically low that you exist at all. Uh, and and the fact that you're, we're communicating now, that we're speaking to each other now, that's also like, I mean, what... It, I mean, if, if theoretically we live for a short period and then we die for all of eternity and there's nothing, it's a kind of void, what are the chances that now is now and that we're alive and that we're speaking? You know what I mean? It's just like things like that. I mean, I think the, the idea of the eternal uh, reoccurrence is Nietzsche. Nietzsche, it's a kind of view that it's an ancient view uh, that f- some philosophers held or be- uh, believed in. This idea that um, we live our lives in a kind of an eternal reoccurrence. It's sort of like a, um, it's like that movie um, uh, Groundhog Day, right? Groundhog, yeah. And um, I mean, it almost seems like it's kind of, it's something that could even be sort of scientifically verifiable. Like, for example, if 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 the soul is ultimately the consequence of, of particular atoms coming together in a body and so forth, uh, if you take a kind of, even if you take a materialistic uh, view of of the universe, um, so it, I mean, it's it's related as well to the idea that uh, if a chimpanzee is uh, typing Shakespeare, uh, or is, t- is yeah yeah, Shakespeare there's an or, infinite I mean, amount of time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and there's I mean, a finite amount of things. the chimpanzee will will yeah. type Shakespeare. Uh, yeah. If you so if you assume that the universe is infinite, then it kind of makes sense that there would be an eternal reoccurrence that this mm-hmm. life would happen again. How could it not? If you're assuming, uh, you know, uh, in a, uh, a sort of infinitude, how could it not occur again? Mm-hmm. Right. Even if you look, even if you're looking at the world in a completely materialistic uh, way, you know, in, in considering the laws of physics and so forth. Um, so, but, but Christianity and- doesn't, uh, uh, assume in infinity Christianity. There's a beginning and an end. Um, so I, I think that's, I mean, I, I, I do think that those are the, you know, two major branches of, of what Nietzsche was getting at in, in an, in eternal universe. There's no ending and no beginning. It's always going and reproducing and re- being born again, if, if you will, um, yeah, ver- versus a, that... a Christian view of a, a real some sort of development. There's a beginning and an end and an end times that you can locate. I mean, one thing that I think that we'll say that in, I'm sure Richard will agree with me on this, it, that uh, both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament are absolute works of genius. I mean, it's, it's just incredible uh, what's contained in those books. And uh, as works of religion and works of art, I mean, they might stand as the most genius works of man. I mean, I think it's, or at least in terms of the production of culture and so forth, right? I mean, there were other realms of genius, of course. You know, people in- invented rockets to fly to the moon. They they invented the nuclear bomb, unfortunately, and things like this. But Raman has a tendency um, to take over. I don't you know, know if so I, we, I think that the strange yeah. thing is that we actually have, like, <laughs> I feel like that we have a kind of respect for biblical words. Uh, I've talked to Brahman before. I don't have a problem with him, but... Uh... 
He's uh, so, loquacious. Like, wait, lack. I don't know. You know, it's like, <laughs> loquacious. You know, yeah. I, you yeah. know I'm not. That's not way. criticism. Certainly, present company. You know, <sighs> I, 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 you know, and I have no reason to doubt your your devotion or piety or anything like this. Um, but I think you understand our perspective. We, we're kind of re- we're in a strange way very respectful of Christianity. It's mostly and, just Nick and and, and uh, even Richard Judaism, just staring uh, blankly. Though of, we the see camera. Judaism, of of course, is very a kind fascinating of visual mothership that has to be de- deconstructed and destroyed. Right? Nick doesn't yeah. like Brahmin at all. <laughs> I mean, if right. we're, if we're yeah. just being honest, you know what I mean. Um, but in in, in any case, yeah. In any case. Nick, I'm I'm glad that we can have a, a friendly conversation about these matters. And um Yeah, likewise. I mean, that's yeah. uh I think it's par for the course, just like politics. I mean, it's not to me, it's not personal. I know atheists exist. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that doesn't I mean it bothers me, but not like, hey, get out of my face. You know, I mean we can mm-hmm. we can talk about the uh, differences, so for sure. Yeah, well, it's again, like those I, interfaith I don't consider myself dialogues. an atheist. Yeah, I don't consider yeah, myself. Yeah, oh no, it's fine. Yeah. It's like those interfaith <laughs> dialogues that are when I was in high school, where there, there would be like the rabbi mm-hmm. and the Catholic and the Protestant or something. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll have a new version of that where yeah, we'll yeah, all agree one, on all sorts thing- of things. Yeah. Okay, just I think you dropped out. Um, just cut him, just okay, cut him let right, me go yeah. to we'll, we'll power it, through Mick. these next four here, four here. So Sam me, uh, Schwellenbach. Oh, hey guys, welcome Nick. Uh, big fan of yours. Hi. Uh, uh, question. Big Tech claims that's him. Uh, There's no way they'll bring him. Legitimate conversation. Uh, um, managerial uh, class doesn't seem uh, especially. They'll, there's no Actually, way they'll let on big tech at this arguments. point. What do you think about uh, effective ways to motivate them or convince them or bully them? Motivate who? Our, uh, our sort of managerial class, you know, the people in uh, the universities, corporate leadership. Uh, you know, you see. To do what? Well, to do, you know, what you want them to do, I mean, your, your perspective, I mean, everyone's perspective is to have a more sort of common sense attitude, a more kind of reasonable attitude towards all these different issues. You know, we've had millions Weed? of immigrants, and, you know, I mean, obviously <laughs> a more kind of reasonable attitude towards that is a, yeah, we're, we're All right, I'll jump tonight. in here. Yeah. I don't think we can ma- uh, motivate the managerial class because they're they're not going to really answer to us. And the managerial class, they they answer to money to some extent, but they answer to power, and we don't got it. Uh, yeah. We have we've got some influence, and we have a little bit of power, but there, you know, it, I don't think we're going to go and convince like a bureaucrat that we're right and he's going to work on our behalf or, or like someone in middle management at Amazon is going to, you know, I, it's, a, I don't, it I don't know how to crack that nut, bean it but up. I don't think we, I the think only people who they answer to are the people who can fire them directly <laughs> or paying their paycheck. Mean I mean, that, that is who mean. they are. They, they are instruments. <laughs> and so I think that. we need to try to influence other people. Uh, but people who butter their bread by working for the regime, I mean, why would they want to risk that? They're not the type to do that. I guess yeah. that's my kind of cynical and depressing answer to that question. Yeah, well, I totally agree. I mean, I think it's just the age old question of, you know, are we are we trying to red fill the masses or whatever? <laughs> um, and I think the uh, the power doesn't come from them. And, you know, it's sort of it's sort of like begging the question. It's like, how would you uh, influence the the middle managers or the lower people? Well, you would need power to do that. So that necessarily entails going above their pay grade. Um, so, and at that point, you've solved it. You know, how, how do you get the people on the bottom? Well, you need the institutions at the top. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, there was something about uh, there. I think there was a story that I read in. Um, one of these books on on the World War II, um, but it was uh, Joseph Goebbels. When he was an activist in the party, he was always getting his balls broken by this Berlin chief of police, just over and over. This guy, he would create new laws, like they'd outlaw brown shirts. I, I forgot all these details. They'd break up rallies, throw them in prison for the night, et cetera, et cetera. 
And he just hated this guy, this chief of police. And after the um, taking of power in 1933, the chief of police came to visit Goebbels in his office. And, and you know, he had almost made this man into like a monster in his mind. You know, he was kind of waiting back. And the guy came in and clicked his heels. And he was like, all right, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> and again, you know, like, who should I oppress on your behalf, sir? Uh, and that's, that, I, I, I don't want to dehumanize these people, but that's kind of how they are. They'll, they would, all of these people who you hate, they would have been good Nazis. Uh, they would have been good communists. They would have been good Finnish nationalists. It, it's just about, you know, they, they're smart. They recognize how the system works, what you have to say. They're very, they, they know the language and how you, they're, they're, they're very attuned to their environment and they know how to work the ways up. So, yeah, I mean, it is that kind of like, I guess, cart and horse problem or, you know, mm -hmm. of like, once you have power, they're already on your side. But, you know, how do you get power? Um, that's the issue. All right. They're I'll, more, I'll they're try... more useful than uh, social media anons is what you're trying to say, I think. Well, yeah, social media anons will never. Um, right. They'll never click their heels. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. We'll we'll do these. I'll, I'll try to be concise because we're we've been going for a while here. Um, OK, big tech. Uh oh, they did it. You're off. Hey, let's go. <laughs> I know we're in the lightning round. Oh, great. He's nervous. Lightning round. Quick question, two parts. First part, Nick and then Richard. Hey, big fans of both of you guys. Gun in your mouth, which one would you choose to lead the world right now? Pope Francis or Hitler? Who would be better? Part two, you got to choose which tune porn you're going to watch. Is it Family oh, Guy or The Simpsons? Thanks for letting me call in. Retarded. You don't have to answer that. You can um, <laughs> Paul Francis. That was his okay. shot. Oh, okay. man. That was I his only agree. shot. Yes. I don't want to talk about tune porn. That was his um, shot, and he said it so I nervous. As much you as what a said. pussy. Right. Yeah. Are you kidding oh, me? Okay. Uh, spin well, I got a sound effect spin for seat. that. Oh, my God. Oh, he fumbled it so bad. Uh, for, for this one. Uh, big hell, of you it's nice fucking to faggot. Ah! Um, <laughs> If you can really quickly, I know you've been here a while. Would you two go head to head on Russia, Ukraine, and NATO, and the European Union? Uh, I think oh, even the Grippers are going to agree late. with me. Fuck yeah, I will be as concise as baggage. possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> everyone needs a good Holy enemy. Russia can act as that enemy. So NATO Fumble is the bag. armed forces. Oh that, it might include Turkey as He's well, but nervous, it's basically a European it. army. The Europeans don't have their own oh army. God, this is what it is. It also connects what a America you with are the too. whole continent. Oh, if I could divide a pathetic Apollonian armed jump in there, dude. You got her after that. Uh, they will bring you in. I understand. Well, no I'm, not, I'm not in there under my name. Or Globo Homo or whatever you want to say. But the world is gay and Globo Homo. I mean, that's not NATO's. Uh, a, a problem. Uh, I think oh, that get off your knees, it's a real Mike tragedy that we're, oh. that we're forgetting about Ukraine. Um, and I think the the Ukraine he question oh, brought up no! real questions about like who are we? Who are we is a West? verb now. And oh, I think those are God. good. So um, <laughs> if I were to be as concise as possible, that's how I would do it. It's uh, an interesting Mike, take. Big Tech Lowry uh, just jained I'm it. Merely in favor of Russia because I like to see the U.S. Oh. regime humiliated, and um, I think that the more that Russia, the more that American influence in the world diminishes, the better it is for dissidents in America. Because I'm just very threatened by liberal hegemony. Can you and, expand um, on that and and play that out? Because I've heard you say that before. Uh, somebody kind of please clip that why, part. Why too. that is? Why why is that the case? That if American because power I, diminishes, it's good for dissidents in the country. I, I've never stopped at that point. I've always said that I'm a perfect example of this. In the United States, I can't have a bank account. I can't have payment processing. Mm -hmm. I can't have access to social media. Theoretically, if there is some world order where we can access a Chinese service for those types of things, or even if it becomes inhospitable for a person like me to live in the that United States, that was one of the worst fumbles I've ever anywhere, seen. I'm not kidding. That was under the that was top, umbrella man. of China or Russia. That was corny as fuck, too. Edward we couldn't Snowden, come up with he better than that. The NSA, where did he go? He couldn't go come to on, man. anywhere Jeez in the world other than Russia. Yeah, but they're, they're that friendly time to him. Because only Russia could protect him. Yeah, but are they not friendly to him out of spite of America? Not necessarily because they believe in his cause. Check your DMs. Like, do you really think China and Russia? Yeah, what difference does it make? 
It would what, make a huge difference. difference. Does it make? Well, I mean, they would just use you as a pawn, and 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 that's to, that. You're assuming they would even use you at all. I mean, it's, Russia... it's just it's arbitrage. It's dissent arbitrage. The United States welcomes Russia and China's dissidents. Russia and China welcome America's dissidents. It's the same reason the American colonists got support during uh, the American Revolution from France. And yeah, there was some, you know, there was some ideological kinship there as well. Uh, but they also did it because they hated the British. And yeah, this... a free America countered uh, the British. And same thing with Germany releasing Lenin into Russia during the Russian Revolution, which secured Brest-Litovsk. But guess who was in Eastern Europe after World War II? So, you know, there's a there's an international component to the domestic political struggle as well. There always has been. So it's not this is not novel. Oh, not he should have asked for his cozy like town back. And you can understand this. It sounds personal. It sounds like you're saying you have an avenue to get out of here if shit hits the fan rather than actually looking at it as like a global or geopolitical conflict as far as like you don't want you don't actually want China to have like global dominance do you i mean yes, I objective do. no yes, I do. like uh, yes, objectively I do. that would not be good for you even you personally of not course just it would be cause. good for me it would be good for everybody no it would be good I, for everybody look at look at yeah i'm York afraid i might have to disagree with you of china yeah go ahead <laughs> I, I mean, you're they're going to turn you into a Chinese, Nick, and they're going to treat you like they treat the Chinese. Maybe for five minutes, they'll be like, oh, Nick really pisses off like people we hate. Uh, you know, we give him payment processor, you know, like he <laughs> he caused great harm to evil American Yankee. Like that might happen for five minutes. But the second the idea of living in a Chinese world, I mean, here, I guess I am kind of a dyed in the wool conservative wasp or something like the the idea of living in under Chinese hegemony is something I would not wish on my enemies, actually, or I would no, wish. I on know, my enemies, I'm being a little honest, contrarian. I don't, I don't really want China to control the world. I will say yeah. this, though. Uh, Chinese hegemony would look different from American hegemony because China is an inward facing country. It always has been. So, mm -hmm. you know, people do a lot of fear mongering and they say they they, they create this idea that like we'll be under a Chinese occupation. And I don't think that's what it would look like necessarily. Regardless, though, the point stands China. America will be a superpower throughout this century. It's just that America will not have the kind of uncontested dominance and influence it has in the world. And that that does actually mean that it's better for dissidents. It means that, you know, for example, things like TikTok. TikTok saw the rise of a guy like Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate and even some of these other things that proliferate on TikTok could never proliferate on American social media. <laughs> That's because ByteDance jurisdiction is in China. And so I think, you know, it's just like with the immigrants coming over here. I don't want immigrants to be in America, but it's useful that they're against Israel. Similarly, China and Russia are regaining their sort of historical place in the world. It was, uh, it was an aberration of history that China and Russia have been so relatively weak for the last 30 years, it was necessary and inevitable that they would retake this position. Again, this I see this as an opportunity to discredit the current regime. And I also see it as an opportunity. And, you know, you say it's personal, but it's really a distinction without a difference. I am the ultimate <laughs> dissident. I mean, or, or one of the ultimate dissidents. If there's going to no, be dissent... Here. <laughs> it's going to come from a guy like me. I mean, if I can't dissent, I would never can't, do that because I'm the one that's. Uh, you got the you straight know, cred now after yesterday. Or one of the most uh, yeah, ostracized it's, so it's, or whatever. Even in, even in even in recent American history, whenever you have a large opposition force, you can see that the dominant party actually gets more power. I mean, just look twenty years ago, like George Bush, for example. Let's say George Bush was fighting a power that was greater than Afghanistan and Iraq. What do you think would happen? Do you think we'd get more Patriot Acts? Yeah, we'd get it tenfold. Like we'd get we'd get 40, 50 more years of of Nikki Haley, George Bush type politics. Like if anything, if if Americans see Russia and China and all these countries gaining power, do they not get behind the people who are in power to say we want to push back against it? I just don't see the avenue that you're seeing as far as the dissidents go. I mean, you see China not liking. I mean, you don't want to be a Jackson Hinkle for China, do you? I mean, if anything, just out of principle, that's kind of pathetic. I mean, that's just a dumb. That's just a non-argument, though. Uh, well, okay, well ja that, Jackson Hinkle is like clearly a Russian asset. I mean, like, do you well, disagree I, he's with a that? Shill, but saying, but saying, yeah. you know, no, you, no, I'm not saying it's a shill thing. A Jackson Hinkle. I mean, that's not an argument, though. Yeah, okay, I know some fine. people who think that, that as well. Everything what I Richard said, said before that is still relevant. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but that your avenue as a dissident makes mm. is 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 impacted. Well, he's literally married to like Miss Universe Russia or some shit. 
you know, China yeah. becomes powerful. I just uh, are about to be. I, I, it, the logic doesn't follow, and I think that you're. I think a lot of this, even if you don't understand it, subconsciously comes from spite, because the the state has you know kind of put their thumb on you, and that's annoyed you, and you have every right to say like that's fucked up, and it is, and you gain support from it. But that then, but then to go out and say okay, because of this, I'm now anti-American. I'm I'm pro-American, but anti-American at the same time. It's it, it's just convoluted and kind of silly. I mean, you have to see that. I don't know. I, I don't think it's convoluted. I don't think it's silly because the regime that is over there in Ukraine and that is over there in Israel and Afghanistan, it's the same. It's literally the same people that are attacking dissidents. It's literally the same people that are funneling the refugees into the country. And when you say it's it's anti-American, it's not anti-American. America goes into these other countries and spreads poison. This is not a good it's not a good regime. Now, here's the thing. If the regime was people that I liked, then I would want the regime to be strong and I would want them to dominate China and dominate Russia and all these other people. But it's the wrong regime. And so I'm in favor of a total regime change and uh, displacing these people. And if that means that they there's sort of like this collapse in their credibility and authority, I support that. Like, for example, when we get pushed out of Afghanistan and we lose the war in Ukraine, this is all the the current regime losing credibility. It's the current regime that's losing respect. It's the current regime that's losing resources and, and failing. I support all of that. And I think that all of that hastens the end of the current regime. I mean, what you're arguing is that we should empower the regime, that, that no, the regime I just don't think should that you should have be a... influence in more places. And, and yeah, I don't have anything against Hinkle. I'm just saying I've heard the that. The reigning before. champion of the world. I don't see how that benefits people that seek the end of the regime. Well, let's I won't go on me... much further, but yeah, let, let, let me submit something. Um, I, I think there is a, a actually kind of fascinating contradiction, though, Nick, because uh, you're, I think your your instincts are to be pro-American, you know, good old fashioned, old time religion, you know, that kind of stuff. And those are uh, those are healthy instincts. Um, but then as you've, you know, interacted in the world and, and faced these enemies and so on, you've got a little bit of that let it burn accelerationism and those two things actually are i mean and i'm not even saying this as like a, a criticism because I, I think we all you know containing contradictions is, is kind of good there there really is a contradiction because like the american regime falling is also going to be the fall of trump in maga i mean it's it's it the whole thing is going to go down it's it's not like there's just liberals there and they lose in ukraine and then Trump takes over. I mean, Trump is part of the thing that's going to fall. And I uh, also I also agree that I think we're headed for a crisis. So it's a very it's it's contradictory and and it's and it's complicated at the same time. There there is something interesting about kind of like <laughs> you're America first but then an enemy of America at the same time. Because what is America first? What do you mean by that? Like, is it because when John McCain says America first, he means the military, basically. That's that's what America is in his mind. It's just faces and wars and, you know, stuff like that. When other people say America first, I think they do mean something else. They, they almost mean the opposite of that. You know, no more military around the world. Let's let's stay at home. Let's let's be more introverted and. and um, and so on. So it, it, I, I think sometimes big ideas are, get conflated in that way. But I think the position that you're in is unique. I, it's it's similar to my position, um, but we've taken you know different paths. But it's it's like you're you're anti-American and the ultimate American at the same time, and you and you'll you'll spread you'll top. express those feelings with equal vigor. <laughs> it's just where you well, are. Though. It's but it's because of you know what is America then? And when you look at, like, when we say that the United States is supporting Ukraine, I mean, what do we mean? We mean that the American state is supporting Ukraine and the American mm -hmm. state are the decision makers inside the state. And they have a certain ideological affinity and they come from an educational pedigree and they have all these ties. And I just think it would be silly to sort of, on the one hand, recognize that they are destroying America and, and they're sort of behind the wheel of America's decline. They're oppressing anybody that tries to reverse this. But then we're also supposed to cheer them on. I mean, to me, that's the contradiction is to say like, well, when Millie 
says that he's tracking white nationalists and learning Florida how they think by reading dollars extremists. Fuentes. So Spencer 2030, I can see oh, out now you know, white nationals you, are going to reclaim a, traitor, a once great America. It will be called says, Make you know, America Great Again. Putin Again, Trump 2024, say, let's go. No, Big tech dropped the ball, guys. Sounded like he just lost a fight. L-O-O-O-L. And he was so nervous. Thank you for that, by the way. means I want them to fail. You can tell by how he started it. He was nervous. Like I said, I think that the rise of China and Russia hastens that. Um and I like I think those per, those are perfect examples is Lenin and Russia, because obviously the Russian Revolution was a, the defeat of Russia, the, the total unequivocal surrender of Russia to its enemies. And, you know, but 20 years later, that wasn't the case. And it was a true change in leadership. And, um, you know, I think that's just sort of a necessary component that that happens. I don't know that America can be dominant and uncontested, but also undergo regime change. I don't see how those things happen simultaneously. That's that's a fair point. Um, I do think that what's going to come after the American why didn't Jaden call him? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. There. Uh, you All think over the world, I think it's going to be worse. This, I, this is where I've kind of I used to be a Ron Paul person, maybe a little bit like you, where it's like you know, mm -hmm. bring the troops home and like we'll we'll just trade with each other and friendship. No, I want people. like an M. I think America should be as big and as powerful as possible. <laughs> okay. But just not under you, the trans flag. I understand. I understand. But you kind of, yeah. Okay. I think you guys See, you, agree on that point more or less. Wouldn't you agree with that, Richard? I mean. Oh, totally. Yeah. I have cinema says yeah. Jay would have done yeah, better. I mean, I'm glad you say that. Honestly, maybe, yeah. I'm glad I'm not talking to one of these people <laughs> yeah. who's like, oh. I'd be hard I mean, hard in my worse. small like, town to be soft. Republic, was definitely channeling Jay tonight. Right. Like, <laughs> fuck <laughs> you. <That's> <laughs> Hey, I Nick, want Rockford, uh, Illinois to be a sovereign state. <laughs> we'll yeah. have foreign policy with Pawtucket. A republic, if you can keep it. Right. What? <laughs> hey, Nick, you, you mentioned uh, Tate. What's your take on uh, Tate? Uh, it's a good I'd thing. I you a Tate bunch of stuff. Oh, let me check. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, he's obviously like a, a scumbag because he's a pimp. And that whole business is just disgusting yeah. and everything. Um, and he's, he's boorish. I mean, I, you know, I don't know that I have an affinity for him personally, but I, you know, and also he is a simp like his whole, if you really got into it, I don't know that we're necessarily very close. Uh, we're not totally aligned, can but you be both a pimp and a simp or you can yes. be both. A pimp and oh, a pimp. Right. All right. Excellent. I think some of the biggest <laughs> players are actually the what biggest the simps because they're they're, it's all wrapped up in women's approval and, you know, women as a source of validation. Could be, um, could, you could have a point there. Oh, smart. Right? Are you kidding? Smash, he, his dude. whole worldview is like, <laughs> what did he said the other day? He's like, after the whole war is over. Yeah, I, I definitely hug. agree. He sent a pic of Hinkle's girl. I mean, or, you know, yeah. Some shit like that. And it's like, yeah, that is what I it's about. I figure we can do a little poll. Smash, um, raw. Uh, but yeah. no, I mean, smash, I think yeah, that he's the figure smash, right? who is... Um, yeah. Like he supports Palestine. He criticized the American policy in Ukraine. He's like anti-feminist. And uh, so I think he's like a truly independent figure and, and honestly more based than most people give him credit. Like he's more based than Tucker. Everyone be says, a shame if Gabe saw Tucker. that. Oh, wow. I see that too. You watch Tucker's show. He's really not <laughs> yeah. that based. Like he says that uh, immigration is a, is a civics problem. It's, a, it's an issue of voting rights and et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and the, the men and women thing is one of the biggest issues. Even if he's telling men to be like vulgar materialists, these guys are it's better than these men that are really like pussies. As long as he's a Russian sex operative, well, like she can do some sex you know, operations on me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Well, no. <laughs> yes, I, no, I, no I kind of understand. I, I was talking to some young people who are undergraduates in college, and I, I asked them, because um, they, they knew who I was, because I know them, but, but I said, have you ever heard of Nick Fuentes? And they were like, Mm, no, they didn't. I, and then I said, so I, I don't mean that as insult. And then I said, have you ever heard of Andrew Tate? And they were like, oh, like, he's so funny. Like, he, he clearly, this was like two years ago. He clearly got at something in the young male mind that they, they, I, again, I might even hate yeah, him more. Yeah, because he's talking about pussy. You do, but wow. I will yeah. grant him Imagine that how he, that works. They are lacking something Imagine talking, in the you know, media that they being a young He just man gave it to them just full he, work. He's coming to late 20s you know, raw, and thinking about fucking um, girls. Yeah. It's energy, crazy. But, Teenage boys are thinking about uh, that too. Yeah. 
I, we, I can't of course, that things, that's all they're thinking. Let's do, yeah. So Once John, we'll do John, John, like and then we'll call it what you a think night because the other people yes. have already asked questions. So John, John, you <laughs> have the last question. Look at his face. Yeah. You have to unmute yourself. John, you bum. Unmute yourself. Hello. My last Thanks. question is for Spencer and Fuentes okay. concerning Henry Kissinger, who died um, today. And I was wondering whether each of you think <laughs> he has had a positive guys, or a negative man. influence on foreign policy. And also, I wanted to hear your thoughts on, you know, Spangler and specifically his decline of the West theory, you know, and his kind of whole pessimistic history. And to to what degree any of you kind of know that figure? You can go first. Because yeah, oh, um, wait, one more thing. Because um, you know, Henry Kissinger actually recommended uh, that Richard Nixon actually read The Decline of the West by Spengler. Hmm. I didn't know that. Um <clears throat> Well, I think that uh, I'm going to be honest, I don't know a ton about Kissinger, but I think that the Nixon foreign policy was good and I thought it was successful. Um, so insofar as I know Kissinger was his secretary of state or whatever, I'm in support of that. And um, as far as Death of the West goes, I read that years ago. I read the abridged version. And honestly, it was a little over my head. I mean, I feel like because, you know, I don't have the liberal arts education you have. So when it starts to get into like, technical stuff about art and architecture. I don't know what he's talking about. You know, I don't know what a flying buttress is at that time and all this. And the calculus, I know a little bit better because I knew math. Mm -hmm. um, so when he get because it's his whole study of civilizations and I don't know uh, every aspect of that. I guess I'm not well-rounded in that way. But um, well, I thought the end was very interesting when he talks about the new Caesarism and he talks about the role of finance in democracy um, and I do tend to agree with him about the cyclical nature of, you know, there's many different theories about the cyclical nature of civilizations. You know, you talked about the, uh, the 80 year thing with Israel and mm -hmm. people talk about the fourth turning and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I think there is a lot of truth to these generational patterns. And I think he's probably right. Um, and he says about the dread of living in the autumn of your civilization. You're born during the, the dying of the, the civilization. And, uh, and I agree. I think that when you look around, it's, it's a lot of problems without any easy answers uh, or any answer at all, actually, because it's it's on a much more fundamental level than people even understand. And I think maybe that's what Spengler was getting at. It's not like, you know, the economy is bad. It's like you, you look at the faces of the people uh, in the newer generations. And, you know, I think Darren Beatty said this, it's who I, you know, I, I have sort of mixed feelings on him lately, but he said, we don't even have a civilization that could produce a genius anymore. It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We don't have the kind of ecosystem or the kind of culture uh, that would produce a great school that would produce a tradition that could hone and, and select and produce a genius. And I don't know how you get that back. Uh, I think once it's gone, it's kind of gone. Uh, we, I think we have the, we possess the potential for a rebirth, but I think maybe that's far off and we have to go through a, a miserable death to get there. In other words, not in our lifetime. So that's my feelings on Spengler. I'll be very brief. Uh, cause it's late. Yeah. Kissinger. Good. Uh, overall good. I like his mentality. Even if I disagree with him, I just like the mentality that he brought to uh, the job and, and there aren't many like him. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll channel some Mark Brahman here. Um, I I think the the real challenge is to overcome the. These are said we need to send we don't Gabe need Hoffman to, to the ash heap. This the sector needs to sit in there, <laughs> metaphorically of speaking. Of course, he said not, we we have sex without yes, producing speaking, babies. Yeah. Even I mean, it's it's just uh, uh, terrible. We don't need to go through that in order to be reborn. You know, strong men create good times, and good times create weak men, and weak men create bad times. Bad times create strong. Men. We don't. We we need to develop institutions and and religious institutions where we don't need to go through these cycles. Like there's there's nothing inherently good about those cycles. It, it might be descriptive in some way, but I I think the real challenge is to overcome that. That we can build things that last millennia in these institutions, and that we can keep be moving forward without the fall of Rome every uh, four hundred years or something like that. Too bad the fat yeah, ass okay. up in Canada is too busy getting his pockets lined by the Zionist monster Gabe Hoffman. <laughs> 
Uh, there's this proto Jewish god Saturn, and it's tough. Metaphor, He's Jupiter got to go to a kosher Kronos deli Saturn. now. <laughs> <Jupiter> <laughs> <has> <laughs> as well, Chronos, and this is how Jupiter becomes immortal. And oh, the okay. idea there in the Roman Empire was that um, you know part of Jupiter's task was to put Chronos or Saturn or time or the seasons to enslave them, to control them, to dominate them. Um, and this would be a way for a kind of immortality of the empire of the what nation. The fuck are they even the talking Roman about race. now, Rob? Um, so I, so they, the Romans were uh, interested well, in this question. That it, it's ultimately Roman not a always goes question. out on a lark. Of course, the ancients mm -hmm. were yeah, what aware the fuck does of this have to, we went from Kissinger to this? so forth. Yeah, I don't uh, know. We see in Daniel, the Book of Daniel, for example, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He gives the um, dream to Nebuchadnezzar. He's kind of giving him a curse. Right, he's interpreting this dream, but he's also in that parable as well. Nebuchadnezzar is like, well, you have to tell me what my dream dream is, right? And so he doesn't. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't even tell uh, the sort of mages that he assembles, uh, including Daniel, what his dream is. So you know, a possible reading of that parable is what? Well, well uh, Daniel is kind of inventing the dream essentially, or he's telling right. But even if he's mm -hmm. not inventing the dream, he's interpreting a dream, right? And he's giving him a, he's demoralizing him effectively. He's saying, oh, the thing is going to decline, right? So uh, as Kissinger goes to Nixon and gives him, you know, decline of the West, he says, hey, here's a little fucking black pill, bitch. You're going down, right? But do we need to go down? Do we need to go down? I don't know. I said, mm -hmm. the TC fan sent $5 free the end Godwin's and TTW. It's never <laughs> Knezzer, I know. Why it's does it have to be degenerate? Uh, and the reason it has to be degenerate is because, well, frankly, we're controlled by a Jewish elite. I mean, let's be <laughs> frank here. You know what I mean? But they're they're waning in power. I'm hearing so there's going to be uh, develop a Christmas special, sort of decadent, possibly prodigal, this prodigal holiday season. energy that goes into yeah, the, some the Christmas content. We're getting festive this year, in, mm. in a kind of ascendant direction. Mm. You know, um, that's my feeling on it. And uh, thank you, you know, and, and it's, it seems like a kind of obvious answer. Uh, you know, and, and if we're talking, if we're invested in this struggle for civilization. Let's get real. Let's figure out. Let's figure out the problem. You know this this idea of cycles. It's ultimately a metaphor. It's related to like harvest metaphors, and mm -hmm. they're all, and it's ultimately given to us through religions uh, of this sort of harvest. This, this cycle. And uh, well, we're not crops. We're not livestock animals. We should control our destiny. We should you know we should get a handle on ladies and gentlemen and figure out a way to uh, <laughs> give it greater permanence. <laughs> And I think part of that answer too is developing a sort of uh, it's alive um, uh, Ralph news alert that um Live news alert <laughs> what's this as an <laughs> you know they want their chill what you know why I'm awake now Ralph you know, sure, <laughs> <have to> <laughs> give me some <laughs> news bro you know it, it shouldn't be like you know the turtle, Southern Dingo like, sent three dollars it's never a Kernesa you brown retard is that really Dingo killed by you know we're humans we should solve this problem we should give. Our, our lineage a greater chance Dollar of Bill Dingo! we should create the environment the milieu that makes it possible <laughs> we're intelligent we put people on the moon we can fucking figure this shit out you know what i mean but it's establishing uh uh it, it's establishing a culture essentially you know and it, it requires it, you know as nick was saying it requires that genius and uh god well if we're stinky you know, poopy sent 15 dollars you know, Brahmin's talking, so I don't care. I'll play it. I'll play it. It's almost over. I'll, I'll swear I'll play both your songs. A little short. I mean, you know, we can do. I swear. You might as well just play the music over them. Just Somebody needs to play him down. off on their fucking you know, end. What I mean, in the hell? Uh, you know, uh, Spangler. Also I don't even know what the fuck that, um, he's I gotta get out. I got shit going on tomorrow. What in the fuck? Right. You know, just play the music over about, Richard and, you know, and Nick looking like I mean, completely you know, perplexed into the camera. Optimism. No, they're going to end it. We're going to go the really distance. Is, is We're going to go the distance. Optimism, you know, finding solutions and solving a problem. That's bravery. That's courage. You know? So I, I don't know. I mean, Spangler, he's overrated in my view. Um, I think he he's worth reading because he does have some insights. Um, but I think he's overrated um, ultimately. All right, Nick.
Thank you. I'm you. glad. Let's do it again. I really enjoyed this. And um, but I we wish you the best and we're really happy that you came on here. And um we'll need to check in because I think things are gonna get wild in the next uh, year. Brutal. So um but uh, Godspeed and <laughs> wish keep doing you the yeah. best. Good luck. Thanks for everything. having me. I thought it was a great call. So uh yeah, awesome. I'd, I'd love to do it again. And likewise, good luck with everything. Thank right, you. Goodbye. We will. All right, guys. Uh, that was uh, really special. So uh, cool. let's just end it Great here. Great call. And, all right. uh, it was so special. I'll talk to you guys soon. It was so special, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching this clip. This is the CACA Lofa. Remember to like and subscribe.